Hello, audience. Welcome to the Multiversity. This week, we have a very special episode for you with a very special guest. We have David Robison here, who's going to be talking about the ropes hypothesis and rational scientific method. I keep wanting to call you Robison because I guess it sounds more like rope, but it's Robison. I now know. Yeah. Um, so here at this po- here at the Multiversity, we like to talk about ideas that are at the cutting edge of what's known and what is acceptable. And this idea definitely qualifies these two ideas. It's both the ropes hypothesis and the rational scientific method are very radical ideas. And uh, we think it's going to be a lot of fun to talk about them today. So how about David, do you want to introduce us to, do you want to introduce us to both those concepts maybe? Yeah, I mean, my name is Dave Robison. Uh, there's not really a whole lot of background to give other than I've always been interested in physics as an amateur. And sometime around 2010, I discovered this guy named Bill Gady on the internet. And at the time, I was more interested in like the philosophy of science. And I found his website and I, I found what he had to say uh, really compelling. And he was saying, this is the scientific method. And now it's referred to as the rational scientific method. It's sort of a competing version of the current version of the scientific method. And then later I found out that he also has something called the rope hypothesis, which is a theory that he is proposing using the rational scientific method. So it's an alternative theory that's supposed to explain the same body of evidence that has been accumulating since, you know, well, since forever, but especially since the time of Newton, the past 300 of uh, 400 years. And so uh, initially I was not terribly impressed with the rope hypothesis, but after a couple of years of studying it and really digging into it, uh, I've come to the conclusion that it's at the very least should be a contender. It's a very compelling, interesting idea and something that I want to make people aware of at the very least. So that, that's really my background. I don't have any special credentials or anything like that, to be clear. Go ahead. We're thinking, we, we're thinking we start with a a kind of brief discussion of the rope hypothesis, like maybe 20 minutes up to half an hour possibly. And then we'd focus more on the rational scientific method because none of us are, are physicists. So we don't, we don't want to spend all our time talking about the physics, but it, we do want to talk about the ropes hypothesis a bit. So maybe we can start off there and give us an overview. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, it might, it might help briefly at the beginning for me to, to talk about what we're, what we're not disputing because I think that throws a lot of people off and turns a lot of people off to like explain what it is that we're not disputing with with current physics so that people understand where we're coming from with the rope hypothesis, if that's okay, just to introduce the rope hypothesis. Okay, Um, so so just to be clear, um, we're not disputing any of the equations of, of modern physics. I'm not disputing any of the equations of relativity, any of the equations of quantum mechanics, All of those equations work. They can make very, very accurate predictions. Um, That is not in dispute. Uh, The the ability to use equations to develop technology is not in dispute. I was in engineering for a couple of years at university, and that's all we did was use math in an engineering context. So the ability to use technology, uh, or excuse me, to use equations in the development of technology is not in dispute either. All of that works and I'm also not disputing any of the evidence that has been around for forever. You know, when they say that uh, atomic clocks on GPS satellites have to be adjusted um, relative to clocks on the earth, I might dispute the explanation that it's time dilation, but I'm not disputing that, that there is um, a discrepancy that arises. So any of the evidence you can think of, if they look at a star and it looks to be orbiting nothing, I'm not disputing that they're seeing that through their telescope. What we're disputing only what we're disputing are their physical interpretations, their proposed explanations for phenomena. So when they're talking about warp space time and zero dimensional particles and, and uh, fields and all of these things, that's where we take issue with, not with the predictive ability of the mathematics, but their claim that because they can make predictions with the mathematics, that their physical interpretations are proven or, or almost proven because of that. If, if, if any of that makes sense. Yeah, sort of. So you're, you're drawing a distinction between uh, the, the mathematical models and their ability to make predictions and how accurate those are based on the evidence and then the, the physical explanation or kind of the model that you're, that you're using in terms of the actual reality behind what's producing those patterns that we observe. Exactly, exactly. 
we're just thinking like we want to get really deep into the rational scientific method. So that definitely we want to make that our focus, but we we're thinking it might be easier to have that discussion if we have a bit of an example to work with. So that's why we were okay. thinking, do you want to give us an overview? Because uh, we've all we've all read your paper about the ropes hypothesis, so we know what it is, but the audience still doesn't know what we're talking about. So maybe we can just sure. give an overview. Yeah, no problem. I have some notes written down here. Let me see if I can find what I got on the rope. Okay. Um, I actually, what did I, I don't even know where I got this thing. Let's see if you guys can see this. So um, try to hold this up to the screen. It might not focus very well. Do you guys see that very well? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, there's okay. there's like two I, twisting threads. Exactly. It's sort of like DNA without the rungs in the middle. Uh, two threads twined around one another in a diametrical fashion. This is what we are saying is a rope. And the basic hypothesis, that is the rope hypothesis, says that every hydrogen atom, hydrogen because hydrogen atom is the simplest atom and it's the building block of all the other atoms. So every hydrogen atom in the entire universe is connected, literally connected by a rope to every other atom in the entire universe, such that a single hydrogen atom is a convergence of these ropes from every other atom in the entire universe, a convergence of gazillions upon gazillions of these incredibly thin ropes. And as every single one of these ropes approaches the surface of an atom, uh, one of them bifurcates or branches off. See if I can make this. Um, so one of them, they break off like this. And one of them, one of them wraps around the atom and the other one penetrates to the center of the atom. So if you do that with every single rope converging on a single atom, you have one thread from each of those ropes. You have gazillions of ropes wrapping around and you have gazill or excuse me, gazillions of threads wrapping around, gazillions of threads penetrating to the center. So all of the threads that are wrapping around the atom from all of those ropes, that forms a shell or balloon-like structure around the atom with a corrugated surface that would resemble a ball of yarn. And that's what we are saying is the electron. It's not a particle. Uh, it's not a, a wave or anything like that. It's actually uh, like a balloon that, that comprised of gazillions of threads that encompasses the proton, which is like a, a dandelion or sea urchin-like structure with gazillions of threads sticking out in all directions. And that gives you the basic architecture of the atom. So uh, what, what, if, are you guys good on that so far? Or? I mean, I have all sorts of questions about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, do you want to, should we ask him or do you want me to keep going and give more of the what are basics? The rape, what are the ropes made out of? So this is probably would get more into the um, philosophy of science type question. But we're saying that when you define the word object, uh, definitions, the only objective uh, criterion for a definition of science is that it has to be able to be used consistently. And so what we're saying is that the definition for the word object, the only definition for the word object that could be used consistently is an object is that with shape. So we're saying that shape is the only fundamental and inherent quality of an object. And so once you reach the level of visualizing an object, you can't reduce any further in trying to analyze, quote, what it's made of. Is shape is its only inherent quality. I mean, I guess you're talking about using words consistently, but when I use the word rope to talk about like that thread in your hand or a rope that I'm actually holding, the proper, the rope is made up of atoms. I understand the rope to made up of atoms and the properties of the rope, like elasticity, flex flexibility, um, its solidity of its surface, those are all emergent properties from interactions between atoms at the <laughs> atomic level. So, so how are, so now you, are you pr you're proposing that there's these objects with the exact same properties that aren't made of atoms that exist on a subatomic level that make up atoms? So how does that make sense? Or how is that consistent? So, how is that using the sure. same word consistently? Uh -huh. So what I'm saying, the only resemblance between the rope that you buy at the hardware store and the subatomic rope is this general shape. Made one, well, if you buy one that has two threads twisted around each other anyway. But uh, a subatomic rope, the properties of the subatomic rope are not going to be anything like the rope that you buy at the hardware store. So the, the emergent properties that you are talking about, like elasticity and all of these other things, do not apply to the subatomic rope. Is, is the subatomic rope flexible and elastic or not? No, it cannot stretch. It, it 
it is under tension. All ropes are always straightened and under tension. So it, it is but under it, tension. It's, like, it's flexible but though. It's flexible though, and it has a solid surface. It, it, it cannot stretch. No, but it, it, oh, has, so, flex, so it has flexibility and solidity. What happens when atoms move closer or further away from each other then? Is the rope like so, and wavy because it can't stretch? And then it, it, like, if they were infinitely far away, then the rope is taut or, or how does that? Yeah, this is one of the big questions about the rope hypothesis and thread theory is how exactly do atoms move? And the way that, that we imagine that working, it's something analogous to a bead sliding along an abacus. So an, and atoms are always pumping. Uh, this is a process known as atom electron transition or quantum jumping in contemporary physics. And what that means under the rope hypothesis is that the electron shell expands and it incorporates thread from the surrounding ropes and then it contracts and release, releases that thread and back and forth, back and forth constantly. And as it does this, when it moves uh, laterally in any kind of motion, it's actually incorporating thread from the ropes in its direction of motion and unincorporating thread out the back uh, as it is moving. So that the ropes are almost, it's almost like a semi-static background. The ropes track the motion of the atoms to which they are connected but the atoms slide along the ropes as they move. So, so um, I also wanted to bring up that uh, you, you seem to, um, in, in, in the explanation of magnetic fields, uh, there seems to be a, a scenario where the ropes become loose and they start like swinging around the outside of a, like say a, a wire with an electric current going through it. Um, you said that the ropes can't become loose, but in, it seems like to me in that scenario, the, ro the ropes have come uh, loose. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. That's another issue. Um, if I recall correctly, when Gady talks about it in his, in his big, thick-ass book that he wrote, um, he, he alleges that one link remains on there to maintain the integrity of the rope. But yes, this is an issue, and I'm not sure. It, you're exactly right. In order to explain magnetism, one of the threads comprising the rope has to unwind and then swing around. So the question is, when that magnetism goes away, how is it that the rope rewinds back around to reform itself? And yeah. that's another problem with the rope hypothesis. Absolutely. Okay. Cool. So just, just to be completely clear, Dave, you're, the, the rope hypothesis is claiming that there are these literal ropes that are literally real that make up everything, that make up all the atoms, right? Yes. It's not a metaphor saying there's real, there's no. real ropes down there. Correct. Okay. And you're also claiming that the rope hypothesis is entirely consistent with all the mathematics of quantum physics, of quantum, quantum physics, relativity, and the classical physics that we observe at this level of reality. More or less. I'm saying that first and foremost, I, all I'm saying is that the rope hypothesis provides, um, explanations or mechanisms that can be visualized, at least in simplified form. That's the first and foremost thing that I'm saying. Then I'm saying that, yes, in my opinion, it does a good job of accounting for the same patterns that they are describing with their equations uh, for the most part. Now, maybe there's some mathematics and, and quantum mechanics when they get really deep into, you know, quantum chromodynamics and a lot of the standard model and that stuff that gets so convoluted you know, I'm not going to claim that the rope model is going to account for that stuff. Uh, but the 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 big things. Wait, hang on. But it, it's e it's either like literally real or it's not. Like 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 you can present this two ways, right? You can say like, hey guys, quantum physics can be hard to understand. We need a better way to visualize things. So here's this model that's really going to help you guys visualize it. We it, you know it's kind of a metaphor, but it's a good visualization tool. Or you can say, no, this is literally real. There are these literal subatomic ropes and they explain the physics better than mainstream physics. So like, which claim are you making? I'm making the second claim that they are literally real and that they explain, they, they, they explain mainstream physics. But I, I, what I'm saying is that there is part of physics that has gone so far off the deep end. They have drifted so far from reality that I'm not even attempting to explain it because it's just gibberish. Uh, so I mean, what, what's something you, you like wouldn't? Said, what's something you'd consider to be way off the deep end that you wouldn't attempt to explain? Well, uh, let's take string theory. Uh, let's take you know the mathematics of you know, or or when they get way into the standard model and some of the the mathematics gets 
so immensely complicated and, and convoluted that, you know, let me give you an example. The Large Hadron Collider, that thing generates 600 million collisions per second in the detector. They only save 200 of those. They, they eliminate 99.99997% of the data. And then they have a multi-tiered server farm that collects the little tiny bit that they want. Um, and then they take that as the data using algorithms written by them and these, all this processing power. So that's the type of thing that I'm saying is where they don't know what the hell they're doing. Okay. They're, they're getting so far out there with this. It's getting so much data that who knows what, what they're doing. I don't, they don't know what they're doing. Okay, one thing I wanted to talk about with you, David, I wanted to kind of run through quantum entanglement a little bit with this rope hypothesis just to get a better idea of how these ropes are supposed to map onto re regular physics. Uh -huh. How would you map the rope hypothesis onto quantum entanglement? Okay. So that's somewhat of an advanced topic, and I think, and I will, I'll tell you here in a second, but I think it would be um, important to explain like how light works, first of all under the rope hypothesis, because this has to do with light. The answer has to do with light. So um, I, I said earlier that all atoms are, are connected by these ropes under the proposal. To, to clarify, each atom has 10 to the 80 ropes coming off of it, connecting to every single other atom in the universe, yes? Well, if that's your estimate of the number of atoms in the universe, sure. There is a, fi that's under the, the theory, that's there's the official a finite. Estimate. That's the official estimate. Yeah, no. that's, that's the number I've heard throw, thrown around for number of atoms in the universe is, yeah, about 10 to the 80. Sure, but we have absolutely no way of knowing how many atoms there are in the entire universe. But let's take that figure, fine, 10 to the 80. Then yes, there would be 10 to the 80 uh, ropes minus one converging on a single atom. Yes. Okay, so light and gravity. So the, the rope can simulate all of the known properties of light because uh, you have amplitude, which under the rope hypothesis, for a single rope, that's link height. A link being one twist on the rope. So link height is amplitude. We all know amplitude for waves. Um, that can also simulate wavelength and frequency. Wavelength being the link length and frequency being the number of links per unit length. So I talked earlier about uh, atom electron transition or quantum jumping where the electron shell is, is uh, expanding and tracting. This motion, torques the ends of all of the ropes extending from an atom. So it's like if you had a taut clothesline stretched out and you were twisting the end of that clothesline, you can see a clothespin at the other end moving in response to that. That's akin to what's happening as an atom is pumping, it's torquing the ends of all of the ropes extending out from it. And that torsional motion along the rope is the phenomenon known as light. The tension on the rope, because the same process, the pumping, creates a little inward tug on all of the ropes. So there's this mutual tugging going on between every atom and every other atom in the entire universe simultaneously. That mutual tug generates tension on all of the ropes. And so the aggregate tension along all the ropes binding any two objects in the universe is what we know as the phenomenon of gravity. So actually there's an interesting quote I'll read you from Einstein here. When he's talking about ether and the theory of relativity, in uh, 1920, Let's see if I can find this. Uh, 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 yeah, so he says, um, uh, of course it would be a great advance if we could succeed in comprehending the gravitational field and the electromagnetic field together, the electromagnetic referring to light is, is conceived of as being an electromagnetic wave. Um, if we could conceive, uh, or electromagnetic radiation, of course it would be a great advance if we could succeed in comprehending the gravitational field and the electromagnetic field together as one unified conformation. Then for the first time, the epoch of theoretical physics founded by Faraday and Maxwell would reach a sa satisfactory conclusion. Well, this is basically what we're doing with the rope hypothesis. We have taken light and gravity and we're using one single object to explain all of the properties of light and gravity and inertial mass because you have torsion being light and tension being what ends up being gravity. Um, so yeah, that's the basics. And, and, and the, interesting, the interesting part about, if you look, if you actually, if you look at um, Newton's equation for, for gravitational attraction, his law of gravitation, Make sure I have everything here. Um, yeah, okay, so 
And by the way, because everything's connected to everything else and all the ropes are under tension, this explains the per pervasiveness of gra gravity. This ex explains why they say that every atom in the universe is attracted to every other atom in the universe because of that mutual tug. But when, uh, with uh, Newton's law of gravitation, which is the force of gravity equals gravitational constant times mass one times mass two all over d squared, um, that mass one times mass two is interesting for the rope hypothesis. Because if you take two objects, now let's say I have uh, a universe that only has seven atoms in it. Now this is one object over here with four atoms, one, uh, one object over here with three atoms. And we draw connections between all of these because we're, we're taking the rope hypothesis um, configuration. If you were to count the number of interconnections between these two objects, you would get 12. Three times four is 12. Uh, if I add a fourth atom here, you got 16. Five, you got 20. So it just, just so happens to work out that if you multiply the number of hydrogen atoms, which is the building block of all the other elements too, if you multiply the number of atoms in one object by, by the number of atoms in another object, it will automatically return to you the number of interconnecting ropes. And because that is going to uh, be the determining factor of the gravitational uh, tension between those objects, it, it provides a physical interpretation for the meaning of mass one times mass two. Mass meaning the number of hydrogen atoms. Multiply those two. You don't literally get a number of ropes. It's expressed in kilograms. But that, the, and that explains that aspects of Newton's equation. And I could keep going. We could explain the, the d squared on the bottom and how that all fits in. But one of the main last things I'll bring up here before I stop talking is that Newton's equation implies that the speed of gravity is infinite. So when two objects come closer together, there's no time variable in Newton's equation that says, oh, it takes time for the, you know, me to feel the greater gravitation when I get closer to some object. I feel that instantly. I feel it immediately as it gets closer. Physicists could not wrap their head around that because they're always thinking in terms of particles or waves. And it takes time for a particle to traverse a distance from one thing to another. It takes time for a wave like ripples on the surface of a pond or a longitudinal wave to traverse from one place to another. So they, they could not wrap their minds around that. And Einstein, when he eventually came up with general relativity and the warp space time, ended up saying that, well, special relativity, the, the propagation of whatever gravity is, cannot go faster than the speed of light. But what the rope hypothesis provides is a mechanism for that greater gravitation to be felt immediately as two objects come closer together because they are already connected by an extended object that is under tension. I've something I've been wondering since I first read the rope hypothesis paper. If you have all these ropes that are connecting every atom and they're under tension between each other, why don't they become hopelessly tangled like immediately? Yeah, and this is probably probably people's biggest contention with the rope hypothesis and I, I am right there with you it's it's uh, the rope hypothesis what we call the light on light problem and the rope hypothesis has to assume that ropes are capable of passing through each other ropes not only passing through ropes uh, but ropes have to pass through atoms if I walk across this room there's ropes connecting these these atoms of either side of my wall I have to be able to just glide right through these with no problem so ha they have to be able to pass through each other. But one, one little thing I will add to this is that every theory of physics is going to run into this problem, even if we're talking about photons. It's not as obvious with photons because we don't really, photons are conceived of as being zero dimensional, sizeless, shapeless, whatevers. So we're not really visualizing it. And the, the problem of photons bouncing off each other doesn't really dawn on us. But there was actually a, a, an interesting interview between um, Neil deGrasse Tyson and, and Brian Cox, two famous uh, physicists. And they're talking about, well, this is like right after one of the Star Wars came out. And they're talking about what kind of technology in Star Wars would be possible. And they're questioning lightsabers. Would lightsabers be possible? And they said, no, because light does not interfere with light. When you take two flashlights and shine them at each other, the, the beams don't interfere with each other. It's not like taking two hoses and pointing them at each other and the water splashes all over the place. Light doesn't interfere with light, they say, except in really, really high energy situations. But for all intents and purposes, light does not interfere with itself. So what that means is that if photons bounced off each other or deflected off each other, you wouldn't be able to see me. I wouldn't be able to see my computer. There'd be so, light would scatter itself 
and it would be complete chaos and we'd only get white noise to our eyes. Uh, we wouldn't be able to see anything. So this is a problem that will affect any theory of physics. It's only more obvious under the Rope hypothesis because we're proposing visualizable objects and then it becomes immediately obvious. Well, why don't they tangle? You're proposing literal objects, right? Like mainstream physics isn't saying that photons are little balls, but you are saying that they're little, you're talking about little ropes, but now these little ropes are like, um, they're like that X-Men Kitty Pride. They can like pass through walls. Yes. So they, what I'm saying is that they're, they're first and foremost, they have their shape. So uh, I'm not saying that makes them solid in the sense that they cannot pass through each other. And I can visualize them pass. I'm, I'm doing as uh, best I can trying to justify this, but I, I agree with you. It should disturb the hell out of you, this, this portion of the theory. I don't see any way around it. We've tried a million ways to, to come up with a way around this, but I don't see any way around it. But yes, we are, we are suggesting that at that level of reality, that matter behaves in a counterintuitive way such that whether the ropes, when they crisscross, maybe they momentarily merge and then come apart, but they maintain their individuality at their ends, but they do have to be able to pass through each other. And whether, 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 whether you could swallow that or not, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. So, so but most how, people I, that. I also wanted to bring up a, 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 a couple other questions I had about the ropes and their behavior. Um, do ropes have, have mass, um, for one, because I was reading about, uh, how, of course, general relativity theorizes that um, a, a strong, a large mass should be able to bend light. And actually, this has been proven experimentally, uh, you know, where the, the light will be coming from a star that's, you know, it's actually over here. And then there's a large mass over here and it's, it's bending, you know, the, the path of the light. And so, you know, if, if, if the ropes are always straight and there's never any, uh, you know, there's, you know, there's always tension on the rope, then, you know, how is it that, uh, you know, that the light would bend? So that would be my first question. And the second question is, um, you had, you had a note about, well, maybe I'll, I'll save my second question. <laughs> well, why don't you just try and answer that first yeah, one? Sure. Yeah. You're talking about gravitational lensing there. So, um, photons don't have mass. The ropes, don't have mass either. And the reason for that is because mass is actually a above atomic level phenomenon. Mass, we're talking about inertial mass here. So for example, you have something on a block, a block on, a, on ice and you're trying to push it. It's hard and you have to get it going. You swing something around in a rope. It feels like it's pulling back on you. Uh, the reason for that under the rope hypothesis is because whereas gravity is all of the rope connections between that thing and the earth, pulling it towards the earth, inertia, is the rope connections between that thing and all of the remaining matter in the universe. So that when you swing something around on the rope, you're feeling the resistance of all of those other rope connections pulling back on you that are, that are extending out to every star and galaxy in the remaining universe. This is actually known, uh, a contemporary of Einstein's, uh, Ernst Mach, this is known as Mach's principle. So the, the idea that, let me see if I can find the exact, quote um yeah uh mass out there influences inertia here and this is under the rope hypothesis this is this is because something is connected to everything else in the universe so that means a single rope doesn't have mass a rope is what is responsible for inertial mass and that only occurs at the atomic level uh, whereas an atom is connected to everything and therefore it feels the effect of all the other matter tugging on it as it moves um, and so to answer your question about gravitational lensing, so we have to come up with a different explanation for gravitational lensing. And the way that that is dealt with under the rope hypothesis is that during a solar eclipse, when most of the direct light from the sun is blocked, uh, and we can see the distant starlight, like you said, it seems it appears to be deflected around as if you had a gravity well around the sun, like the little photon balls rolling around like a coin rolling along a wishing well. What's happening under the rope hypothesis excuse me, is, is a simple matter of diffraction. It's an optical phenomenon that we are very well familiar with here on the Earth. What happens is the atom that is in that distant star is connected to an atom in the corona of the sun, and uh, there, the, there's light, there's torquing between those two atoms. That light is pumping, or excuse me, that atom is pumping in response and then relaying the signal through diffraction. 
you know, if you turn a light on in a hallway and you go around the corner, sometimes it seems like the light can go around the corner. The, the atoms comprising the, the corner of the wall are actually relaying that light signal in a new direction. And this is actually what happens in the double slit experiment. It's diffraction. So what we're saying is- Okay, so the, the, the ropes are actually interfering with each other is what you're saying. They're not interfering with each other. I'm saying that uh, the atom in a distant star is connected to an atom in the corona of the sun. Right? Okay. And the, the distant star is, is, is pumping and, and there's, there's the torquing on that rope connected to the atom in the corona. And the atom in the corona is responding to that input by pumping. And it's relaying the signal along a rope that binds that atom in the corona to the atom in the telescope where you detect it. The, the pumping that I mentioned earlier, uh, atom electron transition or quantum jumping, the expansion and contraction of the electron shell of an atom. Okay. So, so the distant starlight is being relayed by an atom. It's, this is a phenomenon that happens you know, on the Earth. Sometimes um, you can see an object that, that, that should be so far away you can't see it, but an atoms in the atmosphere will refract that light. What's happening there, light isn't bending. The ropes are always straight, but it's just that atoms are relaying the signal. Okay, so you mean like a superior yeah. mirage. It's a similar phenomenon. Yes, yes. The, the, yeah. the signal's being relayed by other atoms. Okay, basically, so you're just saying it's not, it, it's basically not a, a gravitational phenomenon. It's actually just an optical phenomenon. Exactly. It has nothing to do with gravity. Interesting. <laughs> okay, and the other question that I wanted to ask is, you, you mentioned something in, I, I can't, I think it was in the Rope Hypothesis paper, where you talk about the pioneer effect, where actually gravity becomes this linear law you know, if you go far away enough. And I didn't quite understand what that was saying. Can you, can you just unpack that for us? Yeah, sure. So I talked earlier about Newton's equation, m1 times m2. And I explained, or at least tried to explain that piece of it. But there's also the all over d squared. So this is a, a part of the, another part of the rope hypothesis that sometimes people have an issue with. So basically what happens to explain that, what that d squared means, why there's an inverse... Uh, proportional inverse square regime of gravity is that as two objects come closer together, the ropes that are connecting them, the gazillions of ropes, let's say we have an apple that's in space that is falling towards the earth. All of the ropes binding that apple to the, to the earth have no choice but to fan out as the apple approaches the earth. So if the apple's really, 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 really far away, those ropes come much closer together and they're all pull or under tension rather at the same angle. Whereas when it gets closer, those ropes fan out. And the idea is that as those ropes fan out, they take advantage of different angles. And so there is a greater aggregate effect of that tension. In other words, there are a greater number of ropes of the overall ropes that are contributing their individual tension to the aggregate. And we call those effective ropes. So what you have is a geometric, within the inverse square regime, you have a geometric increase in the number of effective ropes as two objects come closer together. And that's what, 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 what explains the D squared on the bottom. So if you could um, verbalize the entire right-hand side of Newton's equation, whereas M1 times M2 gets you the total number of interconnecting ropes, D squared factors out the effective ropes that are effectively contributing their tension to the aggregate due to the widening of the angles and the taking advantage of different angles of those ropes. So uh, to, to relate that then to the pioneer, what happens is the pioneer you know, is way, way, way the hell out there past Jupiter. It's getting really far out there. And so the ropes that are, are binding it to the sun are all essentially pulling at the same angle. And the idea that at that distance, it, they're essentially acting like a single rope. So instead of ha having an inverse square regime, instead of having M1 times M2 all over D squared, eventually you just get to all over D. It's a linear relationship. Um, that, that being said, the, the pioneer anomaly is actually incredibly, incredibly tiny. We're talking you know, over the distance of how many billions of whatever, it's like, uh, uh, you know, a couple of thousand kilometers or something, it, which sounds significant, but it's, it's incredibly tiny. So I question whether 
whether that really is what's happening or it's something to do with, um, there could be other possible explanations of that. They explained it in something called uh, thermal recoil, but either way, this is the way Gady explains it under the rope hypothesis, is that at, at those distances, first from the inverse square regime, it enters an exponential regime, and then a, a linear regime as the number of the decrease in the number of effective ropes not really changing all that much at that distance. Okay, yeah, so, so the, the concept okay. of this effective ropes thing is, is pretty unintuitive to me. To me, it seems like as you got closer to the earth and the, you know, the, the ropes are fanning out, as you said, that um, basically there's a, lot, there's a lot more sort of lateral force that gets canceled out between the atoms. Since the, basically, it, it feels like to me if, you're, if, if, a, if an atom is pulling on another atom straight on, uh, you know, on its path of motion, that it's actually going to exert a much greater force than if it's, you know, kind of off center of the atom's motion. Because then, you know, you've, you've got, you know, yeah. you've, got, you've, got, you've, got, you've got atoms that are pulling, you know, on either side of this, of this atom that's coming in like this, right? And so, the, you know, these forces are going to cancel out, right? <laughs> so to me, that's, that's just really unintuitive. So I, I need to see it like on a, on a board or something. Yeah, well, sort of, the sort of the idea is that if the ropes are, are tugging at the same angle, that are along the same direction, that they're not both really contributing their individual tensions to the aggregate. And then as they, uh, as they spread out, that they are contributing their individual tensions to the aggregate. Another most possible way to look at it is to think about it in terms of, let's say, one of the atoms in the apple that is approaching the Earth. Uh, those ropes extending from a single atom are going to be penetrating through a greater surface area on the electron shell. So instead of being, you know, taking up a tiny and having barely any impact on one location of the electron shell, it's spreading out on the surface of all of those electron shells and having a greater impact because of being closer together. But yeah, that's another, it's another open-ended question and issue. Okay. I think we've, we've uh, had kind of an overview of the ropes hypothesis. So we've touched on uh, some arguments in favor of it and some problems with it. Um, I think now would be a good time to move on to the rational scientific method, unless anyone has like a really burning ropes hypothesis question that they must get out now. Well, I had kind of a, a fusion question between the ropes hypothesis and the rational scientific method, um, because, and maybe this would transition well into introducing the rational scientific method. When I was preparing for this episode and you know, watching some of Gady's videos and doing some reading about the rational scientific method, one of the things that it seemed to really focus on and that it seemed to really disagree with about like mainstream physics is that the rational scientific method and people only wanted to deal with objects and things with shape and how I imagined it, things that were kind of concrete. And when physicists talk about things like fields and energy, Katie would be extremely critical and basically say they're just invoking magic essentially, or like mathematic mathematics so that it would meet their equations. And when you were talking about, um, basically just shoehorning in the assumption that the ropes can pass through each other. That seemed like a, a heck of a hell of a lot like magic to me, like almost exactly like what the entire point of the ropes hypothesis and the, the rational scientific method is against. So I don't know, maybe you could address that and like talk a little bit more about the rational scientific method and, and kind of what the point of all this is. Sure. Um, so Y yes, you, you have a point there, but what I'll, what I'll say is the difference is that at the first stage of the rational scientific method, the very first thing that you do is illustrate your objects. It's your exhibits. You illustrate the objects of your theory so that we are eventually going to be able to visualize your explanation. So at that very first stage, this is before we get into ropes crossing through each other, this is before we get into motion of any kind, we're just uh, ha have static representations of the shape of the objects. At that stage of the rational scientific method, we can illustrate the ropes in at least in simplified form. Um, but with, with, every other, with every other theory out there, with, with uh, modern physics, they cannot even illustrate. There is not a single object anywhere in all of modern physics. They can't illustrate warp space time. They'll, they'll do a lower dimensional analogy illustration but it's not meant to be taken literally. They're not, they're not saying that's literally the shape of the object. They can't illustrate a zero dimensional sizeless shapeless particle. They can't illustrate energy for you. They can't illustrate 
everything that they illustrate is a figurative illustration of an abstract uh, mathematical concept. So what they're actually doing is called the fallacy of reification. And that's where, at least in their case, in every case, they're treating an abstract mathematical concept as if it were a concrete entity. When they say warp space time, that actually, that has nothing to do with physics. There is no physical interpretation for that. That only says something about a mathematical description. That's a purely an abstract math concept, but they're treating it as if it's a real entity and they illustrate it, but then they say the little asterisks at the end say, well, that's not really what it looks like. We can't actually imagine it. We can't visualize it. So in that respect, that's one respect in which the rope hypothesis is unique is we can at least visualize the objects. We can visualize their motion. We can visualize the explanations. The question is um, at the very end of it, what about that behavior? Because the last piece of the rational scientific method is the behavior of the object should be understandable in terms of their structure. And that's where you might take issue with ropes being able to pass through each other. Does that really make sense uh, according to their structure? But that, that's at the tail end of the rational scientific method, whereas modern physics fails right out of the gate completely. So it seems like things being able to be visualized and kind of thought of in a concrete 3D way is a really important part to the rational scientific method. What are like the main philosophical tenets of, of the rational scientific method and, and kind of the process that this hypothesis has been developed under? So in the simplest terms, it's just a movie. It's a movie. Yeah, the first frame of the movie is the hypothesis. The rest of the movie reel is the theory. And all we're doing is saying, let us suppose, we're not saying, uh, when, when we make an assumption, we're not saying this is true, let's assume this is true. We're not making claims of knowledge. We're not saying we've proven anything. We're not saying we know this or that. We're not even bringing evidence into it. We're saying, let us suppose that such and such objects exist. Now here are the illustrations or 3D models of those objects. This is the shape of those objects, at least in simplified form. That's step one. Then we say, okay, here are the definitions that we are going to be using. It's not for every word, not for A and the and all those sorts of words, but for the key terms that make or break your theory, we have to have definitions that can be used scientifically, which means that they should be able to be used consistently throughout your dissertation. I shouldn't be able to use a word at place A in my dissertation to point to one concept, and then over here at place B, use it to point to a different concept. I have to be consistent in how I'm using that word, which means I have to be able to define it so crisply and so narrowly that everybody in the audience understands the exact same thing. We're all on the same page. And I would argue you really can only accomplish that by starting with visualization because that's how you break out of the circularity of all words being defined in terms of other words is you start with visualization, then you synthesize your definitions from relations between your objects. So you might talk about distance as the spatial separation between two objects or location as the set of distances from one object to all others, things like that. So okay, the like, second thing- Sorry, I just wanna- sorry. What is the goal of the rational scientific method? Like, are you trying to come to truth? Are you trying to build models? We are trying simply to enhance understanding. We're simply, we're providing a critically reasoned set of criteria necessary for providing an explanation that is understandable to human beings as to how mother nature works. So it's a, it's a, 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 a format, a formal way of proposing an explanation. That's all it is. And the end goal is, is to, to achieve a greater understanding of how nature works. Is understandability like something, is that the main goal or is it, is, is truth the main goal? Because it, it could be that the universe is complicated and, and that it does take a lot of study and it does take abstract concepts to be able to understand. Why, why exactly should we assume that the universe is made up of objects and in 3D and, and could be played out like a movie in our heads? Exactly. Yeah, this is, a, this is a great point because this is something that is always brought up. In fact, uh, Richard, evolutionary biologist Richard Dawkins coined something called middle world. Now, if you guys have heard of this, basically what he's saying is that we evolved at the macroscopic scale in between, in the middle, in between the very, very large supergalactic scale and the really, really small, tiny quantum mechanical scale. So why should we automatically think that 
just because we understand things at this level that we evolved, our brains evolved at this level to understand this level of matter, why should we automatically think that things at say the quantum mechanical scale, really, really, really tiny fundamental levels of matter that we are simian primate brains would automatically have the ability to understand things and in terms of shape, why should it be the same down there? Right. And I completely agree with you. Uh, there, there is no fundamental reason why that should be the case. It is entirely possible that mother nature works in mysterious ways that is that are beyond our ability to comprehend as human primates. However, my issue with that is that if it is the case that mother nature cannot be rationally understood. What that means is that it's not going to help us to try to fill the void of our ignorance with proposed explanations that we also cannot rationalize. If I cannot rationalize what it really means to have zero dimensional particles or warp space time, then I'm not actually explaining anything. It's akin to what theists do when they say, well, we can't understand how uh, at the beginning matter came from nothing, you know, there's nothing, 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 boom, all of a sudden there's matter. And they say, well, God did it. Yeah, okay, th that's their proposed explanation, but that explanation doesn't actually add anything to understanding. It doesn't enhance our understanding. We don't learn anything. I'm saying it's the same thing with modern physics. They can make predictions and they work with the mathematical descriptions, but on the explanation side, it doesn't actually add anything to understanding. When you're saying the warp space time is pushing on the earth, you know, but there is no really, there's no wall of warp space time there then what's pushing on the earth? It doesn't actually, it looks like an explanation, but when you dig under the hood, there is actually no explanation there. It's a blank screen and we don't, it doesn't enhance our understanding of the universe at all. I think the difference, Dave, between what you're doing and what mainstream physics and philosophy I'd say is doing is, it seems that you're limiting valid explanations down to one single human faculty and that's the faculty of visualization. Like, I have a lot of faculties be beyond my ability to visualize. I can conceptualize, I can come up with metaphors, I can do data crunching, I can auditorialize with my ears instead of my visual capacity. Like I can, I can use a lot of different tools. And I think one assumption I would make is that by using a lot of different cognitive capacities, um, in parallel, I'll get a clearer understanding of the universe than if I'm just visualizing. It seems to me that it's more likely that something like visualization is limited by the fact that as Dawkins points out, we evolved to inhabit this middle world of where objects are of certain sizes. It's entirely possible that at different sizes, things just don't look the same or they, they can't be visualized in the same way. So why, so my question to you is why should I limit myself to visualization as the rational scientific message, message, method suggests I should? Well, one thing you should bear in mind is that all of the concepts that they are using, the empirical concepts, because every single one of these variables and every single one of their equations resolves to a process of measurement. Whether we're talking about, a, let's say, well, there's really two broad categories. You have numbers that have dimensions, numbers that don't. You have, uh, say, kilograms, you, you know, volts, uh, joules, whatever it is. That's a comparison between a unit of measurement and that which is being measured. Likewise, if you have a dimensionless number, um, say quantum spin or the coefficient of friction, and in both of these cases, what it, the meaning of that number, the physical meaning of that number resolves to a process of measurement. That is the entire idea behind empiricism. And what is a process of measurement if not an interaction between objects? What I'm suggesting is that the very concepts that they are developing, that they later project uh, through the fallacy of reification, onto reality as being concrete objects, the very concepts that they're developing ultimately source back to relations between objects with shape. They are already implicitly using this to develop their concepts if you trace it back. So they're already I'm implicitly I'm trying to understand your logic here. So you're basically giving an example from physics to argue that um, all concept building and all data processing and all cognitive processes ultimately do boil down to visualization. That, they, that all concepts resolve to relations between objects ultimately. That's where, if you trace it back, at least in, when they're doing physics, when they're talking about using processes of measurement, 
those are whatever they have a detector, something striking detector. You have a magnetometer, something's in, interacting with your magnetometer. We talk about our sensory system, something's interacting with your retinas, something's interacting with your eardrums, something's interacting with your sensory system. These are all physical processes, physical interactions between objects, and they would not even be able to synthesize their empirical concepts like charge and voltage and all of these other things without rooting back to the experiments and the interactions between the objects in the lab that they're using to try to understand them. Well, they, they ultimately do propose uh, things existing in the world that don't, that don't correspond to your definition of what an object is. They ultimately do speak in terms of things that you wouldn't define as objects. Right, and I'm saying that's the issue. They're taking these abstract concepts that they've developed like say charge, where did the charge come from? Well, we could talk about Millikan's oil drop experiment and measuring the charge of the electron and how we perform that to try to understand what charge means. But at the end of the day, it's an abstract concept, but then they turn around and talk about a charge as if it were a, a concrete thing. And they do this the same with say um, warp space time. Well, this is, a, this is an abstract concept, but they're treating it like it's an object when it's not, objectively not. What, what, what do you mean by treating it as an object do you mean using it as a noun as a part of speech i mean when they're saying things like warp space time bends stretches expands what do these words mean they're alluding to a physical context with these words you can stretch your bubble gum you can bend a pipe you can warp a frisbee but they're saying that warp space time can bend stretch expand and they're alluding to a physical context but at the same time, they're saying it's not like that at all, and we can't really imagine what it's like. Well, well, yeah, because when they're saying bend or, or expand, I mean, they're in one sense maybe speaking literally, but in another sense, it could be metaphorical. And I, I'm not a physicist, but I have like studied multivariable calculus, so I have like worked with objects or, or, or things in in multiple dimensions, and I kind of I understand how you could be working with something in 4D and graphing it in 3D. And you could have an equation that shows that quote unquote object, I know it wouldn't meet your definition, expanding or bending or warping. And, and you could work with it like that mathematically, even though in your mind it's, you know, our brains aren't equipped to imagine things in 3D. We can still work with that concept and understand it in, in some way, especially if we map it onto the three-dimensional world. I don't think that's nonsensical. Yeah, I think that's, that's kind of the the implicit magic trick of physics is that like we have all of these equations that explain the behavior of physical reality but we kind of you know we kind of just know that okay this is just a concept that you know may or may not be literally there but we just we just use it as a placeholder because you know it's a variable in this equation that predicts real stuff so I, I think, yeah, I think that's kind of kind of implicit in when you're doing physics that, okay, well, this might not really be there, but it's just, you know, it's a, it's a mathematical concept, which we, which we kind of boil down into three dimensions so that we can hold it in our minds and, and manipulate it. Well, I think they should be explicit about that. If they're, they are either saying these literally exist or they are not, if they're not, fine, they're operating completely in the realm of mathematics and prediction, and I have no problem with that. But when you talk about higher dimensions, the, 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 the dimension of physics is quite a bit different from the dimension of mathematics. Now, the way they define a dimension and mathematics is the number of coordinates that you need to define a point in n-dimensional space. Uh, okay, fine. X comma Y comma Z comma A comma B comma C. Okay, there's six dimensions. Uh, okay, you can, do, you can do that in mathematics. What does that have to do with physical reality? What does it do with explaining anything? The, the dimensions of physics this, this has to do with mutual orthogonality. You have length, width, and height. There is no conceivable fourth mutual perpen mutually perpendicular direction to length, width, and height. So yes, in fact, I'll, I'll give you one more quick thing. If we're talking about Einstein's general relativity, if you apply a few simplifying assumptions to Einstein's general relativity, it reduces exactly to Newton's law of gravitation. There's essentially no difference. All of the alleged differences, you know, whether you're talking about the perihelion shift of Mercury, gravitational lensing, all of these things can be accounted for allegedly using Newtonian mechanics. And the differences are so incredibly tiny uh, that they're making a mountain out of a molehill to push this through. The, the reason that Einstein came up with general relativity was to have something to go with, with special relativity, to fit gravity into a special relativity framework. 
and also because Newton admitted that he had no physical explanation for gravity. His most famous quote, hypothesis non fingo, he says, look, I have uh, 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 you know, an experimental philosophy. I have an equation that works, but I have no mechanistic explanation for gravity and I feign no hypotheses. So part of what Einstein was trying to do was provide something. Physicists, you look at the entire history of, of, of thought of physics, they are always trying to provide physical interpretations. It is only in more recent times that they have abandoned this as a matter of principle. They've given up on rational explanation under the assumption that we cannot rationally understand nature. And I think that we can. Okay, I think there's a lot of problems with all those physical claims you just made, Dave, but we, we kind of want to stick to philosophy in this part of the conversation. So maybe do you want to tell us how you would define rationa ra a rational explanation? Yes. So uh, a rational explanation, in order to qualify as a rational explanation, you have to have a couple of things. One, you got to be able to visual or visualize or illustrate, at least in simplified form, you don't got to draw every rope or particle or whatever your theory is. But you, you have to be able to illustrate the objects of your theory. The basic black or white question is, does it have shape, yes or no? It can't Why? kind of have shape because that's inconceivable. You can't imagine something in between. And what you're saying and is it's, it's irrational to use things that can't be imagined? I'm saying if we can't imagine it, then we cannot imagine the explanation. And it doesn't, explanation, it doesn't explain anything. And it is indistinguishable from traditional religion at that point. That, that, that's, 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 not, that's not true, though. I mean, Katie gave a great oh. example before. Like, we can't, we, using our visual cortex, we can't visualize fourth dimensional space. But using other cognitive tools, like mathematics, we can explain, like, we can still work with it. And you can even work with it in a visual way if you take the derivative of, of, fourth, of fourth dimensional objects or things and, and, and work with it in terms of like the way that it would map into 3D. It, it's not like it's impossible to work with. And also maybe, maybe as we go out and discover more about the universe, we realize that there's patterns that don't make much sense if we're working in three-dimensional space. But if we add a fourth or fifth or sixth dimension in terms of like the coordinates in, in math, then all of a sudden these, these patterns make a lot of sense and you can make equations that make accurate predictions. And maybe we can't imagine it because our brains and our eyes are only set up to interpret three dimensions, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Just because we are operating in a framework that can only perceive three dimensions and can only conceive of three dimensions doesn't mean it's irrational to imagine or conceptualize something outside of that. It's not religious. Well, and the, the other thing I'd like to point out is, I, I don't know if you've ever seen that, that YouTube video, Dave, uh, Imagining the Tenth Dimension, uh, but even, even con very complex, uh, you know, objects, uh, for lack of a better term, um, that, that kind, of, kind of exotic, you know, constructions and stuff that our brains are not used to uh, can usually be boiled down, you know, using analogies um, so that our brains can conceptualize them. And so, you know, maybe, maybe sort of current physics is not very understandable to the average layman, but maybe explained in the right way, it would be. Not even to like a, a large proportion of humanity, but at least to the people who, you know, yeah, at least to maybe like the, the smartest 1% or the smartest 10% of people or something like that. Yeah, and this, this okay, so to go back to something before I address that, there's something Katie said, you're talking, you mentioned existence. And that is, a, a, besides object, the most key term in all of physics. And the second requirement that I'm saying of, of the rational scientific method, you got to be able to define your terms. So we, we all know what you mean specifically by that term. And so existence is one of those key terms. What do you mean by existence? If you're going to say a fourth dimensional whatever exists, what does it mean? What does it mean for it to exist, literally? What does that mean? That's a really good question. Uh, and I know that you're going to hate me for this, uh, but existence is a really tricky term to define, especially if you're talking about multiple dimensions and things that are difficult to conceptualize. I would say existence has something to do with like being part of reality, being part of reality. <laughs> okay. But that's a vague, that's a really vague definition as well. It, it, it is, it is really vague. It is you really vague. You have to define yeah. reality and then, you know, it could be turtles all the way down. And that's yeah. I know why, uh, why the rational scientific method tries to use these maybe oversimplified definitions, but they, they can be used consistently. 
So I, I don't remember exactly uh, what it is, uh, but I do remember reading the rational scientific methods definition of existence. Maybe it was that the object has to have shape and have location. Is that right? Exactly. It says so, the only things that exist are objects with shape and location. Right. Sorry. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's a lot of assumptions, and I, I haven't, <laughs> I have it's not, not it's defined. It's not an existence. assumption, though. It's it's a definition. Okay, well, it's a definition, but the thing is, is that the word existence has a lot of, of really heavy, meaningful connotations baked into it, whereas if we say that, because you, you can define existence as only pertaining to objects that have shape and have location, and then if I talk about four dimensions, then you'll say that doesn't exist, um, and when people hear that, then they'll hear four dimensions is made up and inconceivable, and like you're talking about baloney and you're talking about magic, um, but then the rational scientific method person might come back and just say, no, we're just saying that it doesn't have shape and location. But they're, they're, by using the word exist to mean something specific like shape and location, you get all of the emotional and like impactful connotations of the word existence while creating like this narrow definition. And I, I think that that's a linguistic trick that's being played. Like there's a reason why it's difficult to define existence because that's a, it's one of the deepest philosophical questions that there is. So if you, if you just make like a really set definition and then, and then use that definition in a lot of different contexts, uh, it, it allows you to, I don't, I don't know, kind of yes. play with you people's know, minds a little bit. If, if you're going to talk about fourth, fourth dimensional and mathematics and that being valid for mathematics, that's fine. But I'm saying, if you're going to propose that a fourth dimensional whatever exists, the onus is on you to tell us what you mean by the word exists. And if we cannot understand what you mean by, by your definition, or we can interpret your definition in 10,000 different ways, because what you said is exists something to, to be part of reality, is really just a synonym. You haven't narrowed, the definition is a narrowing of the usage of a term. You haven't narrowed the usage of the term at all. You're just sort of saying X equals Y without telling us what either X or Y mean. So how, how, what, we would have to keep going back and forth and say, what specifically do you mean? What does it mean for something with fourth dimensions to exist? And that's where I'm saying the problem is. That is do, you not, do you not understand what I mean when I say that, that it exists, like that, that it's part of reality? It, is that really? I don't know what it means for something of four dimensions to exist. No. I mean, what one way you would say it if if you were talking about this as a part of a hypothesis or a model, you would say it has explicative power. Like we can make explanations or or even or just predictions, maybe, uh, based on these ideas. And but I wouldn't I wouldn't say that's equal to existing that's not those aren't the same things like i can have a model like like dave says you can have a model which predicts things but it doesn't necessarily mean the things inside that model exist it's just a it's just a way of figuring things out yeah I'd say it, it, it has explicative power but it has explicative power because it's actually it, it actually maps to reality whether i can conceive of what that looks like or not right but that's a that's a well, but logical fallacy you can't really get between those things like you can't you can't say because you know how something's going to act or based based on some ideas like if i say oh the uh the gremlins aren't out today you know or the gremlins came out today and they stopped our motors working so we know that gremlins exist no that's it doesn't work the gremlins are, are a metaphor or so you know they're part of the model but the gremlins aren't real they don't exist well, that's why you need the word exist, right? Like that's why the word exist is important to have in our common understanding as we understand it so that we can make a distinction between, you know, the gremlins, what is like their status of whether they yes. are in reality or not. Yes. And the fourth dimension is, is a similar thing. Like is the fourth dimension just, just an, an idea that helps us work the math or is it something else and what it, what does it mean to exist in that in that way well that's why we need the word exist as it is commonly used and as we commonly understand it as we have historically understood it through the history of philosophy and trying to redefine the word exist to mean object with location and shape you're just destroying the word existence 
I don't think I'm redefining. That, that is a word that is commonly thrown uh, when, when, when we're defining terms. But what that insinuates is that you already have a pre-existing definition that is scientific. There is a distinction between everyday speech and scientific language. And if you're talking about the, the definition of everyday speech and well, people use it in a million different ways, almost every word in a dictionary has multiple different definitions, sometimes conflicting definitions. A lot of those definitions contain, they're just synonymous. They'll say exist is to be, uh, which doesn't really define, it doesn't tell you what existence means. So for the purposes of science specifically, we have to start from square one from scratch and build up a definition to say exactly what we mean by existence so that everybody understands the exact same thing and nobody's confused. I think that the problem is, is that when you, decide, when you define existence to mean has shape and has location in 3D space, which is kind of implied by the rational scientific method, then you're, you're basically just defining it to mean that anything outside of that framework cannot exist. But when you say exist in the second sense, it, when you say it doesn't exist because it doesn't have shape and it doesn't have location, then actually what you're doing is using existence in the colloquial sense, like I'm using. Um, did you repeat the last part of that? So in the second, when I say, when I say a f something with fourth dimensions doesn't exist, doesn't qualify as existing under the definition of ex existence as I'm defining it, that was shape and location. Mm -hmm. um and is that where your issue is or is it that i'm saying well it's just okay say i grant you that um say i grant you that definition of existence where okay we're just gonna for the purposes of this conversation existence means has shape and has location in three-dimensional space uh and then you say okay so by that definition the fourth dimension does not exist and i'll say yes the fourth dimension does not exist by that by that definition well, that's, that's kind of meaningless. We can still talk and about I, the fourth definition, the, the fourth dimension, but now we just don't have a word to talk about its potential. Yeah, to talk about whether it actually yeah, is in reality or not. It's, yeah. It seems like it seems like there should be like a like a um, like a, a tiered system of existence. Like some things sort of more or less literally exist, you know, um, and th and that would that would be according to your your definition of existence. The whole you know it has to be an object and it has to have a location. Um, but it seems like there's a there's a kind of a second tier of existence, which are these things that we're talking about, these concepts, which uh, for all practical purposes appear to exist. And, and anybody's other anybody else's definition, uh, any like the, an average person using the word existence would um, would think of those things as existing too, just not you know maybe not in a strict sense. Here's a question though: in a strict sense, does space exist? Because your definition, having no. shape and having location, implies space because you have to have location within a space. And it's kind of baked into your philosophy that we're only talking about 3D space, but we'll, we'll just forget about that. But do you, would you consider that space exists? Space is an awkward concept. It's really the only thing that can be defined in the negative. And so pursuant to our definition of exist, no, space does not exist. It's nothing. Well, why not to say so why not to say exist. like it conceptually exists but it, it more than conceptually yeah, exists it, it, it actually space, but, but i'm saying it doesn't literally exist no because it's nothing does does behavior exist something has to have to have something has to have, no so p things behavior defined by happens, verbs it occurs but, okay, but, but with you, if you're using that definition of existence how can i it, how it can i just how can i distinguish between imaginary behavior and real behavior if I say like, I went off and flew this morning through the air with my wings, versus if I say, um, I went to the store this morning, one is true, one is, one, is, one is was in existence, one was not in existence, one behavior was existing and one was not, one was imaginary. How can I distinguish them now if there's no word for existence that applies to behavior? When, I guess we could just occurred. use the word real. <laughs> one occurred and one didn't occur, one, one happened and one uh, didn't. No, with, uh, with terms of art, with jargon, they're always going to be different to the way we use words in a colloquial sense. So like people, you know, people say this thing, which, uh, which I didn't understand to begin with. People say correlation does not imply causation. And I'm like, hang on. Well, it kind of does. Well, it kind of hints at it. Right. But no, in this case, imply the word imply has a specific logical meaning, which means it, uh, it means it doesn't necessarily lead to. So it does, 
you can't. It means get it does direct... necessarily lead to. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. In, in, in logic, imply means yeah. this. The, 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 this condition necessarily will happen if this precondition is met. Exactly. So when they say correlation does not imply causation, that means it it doesn't necessarily go there. So we can't expect logicians to just you know take up colloquial terms or common parlance that's not going to happen so in a in a certain specific context we're going to know that people are using different terms and we can't expect them to you know go along with us it's not going to work like that so here's maybe the problem this is maybe this is a better way of articulating the issue that i'm having with your definition of existence is uh okay if existence just means has shape and has location in 3D space, which I guess 3D space doesn't exist, but okay, uh, then, then fine. And people in the rational scientific method could still talk about the possibility of other dimensions being a part of our reality that, that are affecting 3D space and object in 3D space. But they don't because you're actually using, you're, you're defining existence in this way so that you won't talk Outs about anything outside of that box of the narrowly defined definition of existence. You, you are actually saying something about okay. what exists in reality outside of three dimensions. You're, you're saying that nothing outside of three dimensions is possible is what you're saying by defining existence that way. Or at least maybe you're not directly saying it, but that seems to be that the philosophy, the philosophy that the rational scientific method people are going off of. So yeah, let well, I'm going to respond to that. First, I wanted to, to address what Ariel said about, you know, whether motion exists. And just to be clear on that, the reason that we are really, really strict on something like that is because what they will do in physics is take something like a wave and they will take away the physical medium of the wave and say that you can have a wave without a physical medium. So in other words, it's like saying you can have running without the runner. And that's why you have to be really, really, really clear on the distinction. Existence is a static concept. It's not a dynamic concept. It refers to a static concept, at least under this conception, um, object, shape, and location, whereas motion occurs. And then if you want to talk about what happened, whether you went to the store or whether you flew up into the sky, that's a matter of what theory that you propose to explain a consummated event. That is up to the theorist. You can say, let us suppose that I went to the store and that explains why I have these grocery bags. So, so that's the difference there. And then Katie, to respond to you, um, what I would say there is I, I understand exactly, I think, what you're driving at. Um, but anybody is free in science to propose their own definitions. So you don't have to use my definition of existence. You can provide your own definition of existence. The only objective criterion, what I'm saying that lies outside of that, lies outside of my set of definitions, is that it has to be, be, be able to be used consistently such that when you use it at point A in your dissertation, it has to mean the exact same thing at point B and everybody in your audience has to understand it in the exact same way. In other words, it has to be defined narrowly enough so that there's only a single possible interpretation for it. If we can interpret it in a bunch of different ways, the audience is going to interpret your theory in a bunch of different ways. And that's essentially what happens, you know, say with something like religion, when with the congregation and they're all taking, th they're all taking their own interpretations because they're not strictly defining their terms. So you can have a different definition of existence. And if you don't like my objective criterion either, then I would just say, I would just ask you for what your object, what is the objective criterion for a scientific definition? That would be the question. Yeah, I, I think I think like the objection though, Dave, was that you were doing that. Like you were using existence one way here and another way here. Like, like would you say it's possible in your view that four dimensional objects might be real even though they don't exist according to your limited definition of existence? I would just have to say, what does a person mean by what, what do they, they would have to provide, first of all, what is the objective criterion for a definition? What is their cri objective criterion for a scientific definition? So then, then tell me what their definition is. Um, I would say that they're not going to be able to define existence consistently without resolving ultimately to shape and location, because I think this is actually how we already conceptualize existence. The, the, the rational scientific method is just making it explicit. It's absolutely not. It's completely different than how we normally conceptualize existence. Okay, I think Katie, think Katie wants to say something. Oh, uh, 
I, I know that you want us to be able to strictly define existence, but the thing is, is that it, and maybe this is what you're driving at, is that it, it's difficult to to talk about four dimensions in like a in like a strict visualizable way. So like when I say, is it possible that there is a fourth dimension? You you really it's it's difficult to it's difficult to nail down because our perceptions aren't in that kind of a aren't in that kind of a framework it's like asking um i don't know maybe we could imagine being 2d characters that kind of moved on paper like cartoon characters and so one cartoon character asking the other is it possible that a third dimension exists and then the the, the person saying like what do you mean by exist i, I pertaining to and affecting our reality, not being imaginary. Um, yeah, I, 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 think that I think that you're getting caught up on the definitions because I think you do understand what we're asking, at least in a vague general sense. I, I, what I said earlier is that what they mean by fourth dimension or higher dimensions in mathematics specifically is that is the number of coordinates that they use to define a point in n-dimensional space. So my question then is, if you were to say that something fourth dimensional exists, okay, here's a further question. How does it influence matter? How does a fourth dimensional object push on the earth to keep it in orbit around the sun? How does that mechanism work? How does that, how does that explain to us how the earth stays in orbit around the sun? Now, so I mean, this yet. is so, something important, like ac according to the RSM definitions, uh, the fourth dimension doesn't exist, but na neither do length, width, or breadth. And obviously, we know they can they can be used to to measure things, but that's different to existing. Okay, okay, so maybe we shouldn't talk about if the fourth dimension exists, but we should talk about do four dimensional objects exist? Because by RSM definitions, you you could define shape and location of a four dimensional object. Uh, I don't think you could because for again four dimensions you're you're talking about an abstract mathematical concept. You're talking about how many coordinates it takes to define something in four dimensional space. That doesn't have anything to do with shape. You can't well, illustrate okay. the so, shape. Okay, so so like in 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 four dimensional space, like you're using those coordinates to define its location, and you could also use those same coordinates to define its shape. No. But what you're implying there is that there is a fourth mutually perpendicular direction to length with the height. It is impossible to imagine this. It is impossible to visualize this. So in the sense in which I am talking about objects, I'm talking about the ability to visualize their shape. You cannot visualize a fourth dimensional object. How, how do I mean, you know so, I can't so, visualize a fourth dimension? Yeah, I, I find it actually pretty easy to imagine uh, the fourth dimension up to like maybe seven or eight dimensions. I, actually, have you seen that 10 dimensional video that I, that I mentioned earlier? I I have seen it, uh, and all I see are at most two D representations of three dimensional objects. Kurt, maybe if we go have a beer later, yeah. we'll we'll after enough beers, we'll see the the tenth dimension. But I, I I'm telling you, I don't think, and I have quotes. I have quotes from physicists lined up. You know, Brian Cox, for example, he's saying it's impossible to imagine higher dimensions. This is supposed to be one of the smartest theoretical physicists in the world, and he's saying. It's impossible to picture higher dimensions. Yeah, so, I mean, you can do it, but I'm telling you, I've done it. <laughs> well, what, what, we, what we picture are, are 3D that. or 2D mappings of higher dimensions. We, we imagine taking the derivative of... We're combining our conceptual ability and our visual cortex, our, our visualization ability. You're basically saying we should, if we can't arrive at something purely through visualization, I guess it's not real because you've just defined the word existence to me basically to mean objects, but you're saying it's not real. Uh, I'm saying that if you're saying it's real, then simply tell us what your definition of real is so that we can understand what you're talking about. And we need to be able to understand, because we're talking about an explanation of a phenomenon. We're saying something is happening out there. Something is happening out there that it happens and it occurs. And then we have this evidence, this result. You know, we see uh, galactic jets shooting out of the center of a galaxy, and they're saying, well, that's a supermassive black hole. Okay, so then just what do you mean by that? How does that cause the jets? On a step-by-step -step process, explain to me what you mean by this exists, and what does it do, and how does it do it? I mean, I think that's the, maybe the problem is that your, your standards for explanations are impossible. Like, you're basically saying 
define every single term you're doing with total clarity and then through um, tight deductive logic, explain every single step and how it works and make it all visualizable. Like that is not how science or philosophy or human thought has works or has ever worked. Like there's <laughs> like what you're like what you're suggesting. You're basically, you're, basic, you're basically a logical positivist. You know, you know that movement. It's like the, the, the 20th century philosophers who are like, we will explain everything using pure logic. We will, we will take our sense evidence and with our sense evidence, we will use logical formulas and we will have every word be defined. And then we will arrive at the truth of the universe and we will only use words according to these definitions from now on and use these logical deductive systems. And you know what? You know why they don't really teach logic anymore in, in philosophy or in high school? Because it doesn't work. They proved mathematically that it doesn't work and that you can't do that. That's Gödel's incompleteness theorem. It killed logical positivism, and you're like trying to bring it back, and I don't understand what your motivation is here. Sorry, they mathematically proved that logic doesn't work? They've mathematically proven that you can't explain all of reality using, uh, using deductive logic, using any okay. language of logic. It doesn't work. That pro okay. They've also proved that's not actually how language works. That's what Basically, because, because, because language and, and math all become self-referential at some point, essentially, right? So, but the RSM is, is, is uh, proposing a new system where everybody kind of agrees on the axioms of the system. And when you do that, then you can all work within the same logical system to produce meaningful results. I'm saying At least not, within not, the people not, who are participating. A, that's not a new idea. That's exactly, what, that's exactly what Bertrand Russell and all those guys were trying to do 80, 90 years ago. And what, and what happened is you can do that. You can define a bunch of terms and you can do logic on them and you can come up with your own little closed world that can do fun fit. You can do fun logic within your closed world, but you can't explain reality that way. You can't explain the open system of reality that way. It fails for so many reasons. All I was going to say is uh, the rational scientific method has nothing to do with logic. It's not a logical system. It is a set of assumptions about reality. We're making assumptions about reality with our definitions. But let's put it this way. What we, we have access to directly is our sensory system, right? What you get through your eyes, your ears, your senses in your skin. And by extension, we have scientific instruments. And every single conceivable empirical interaction resolves to some kind of interaction between some things out there. And all I'm saying is that this, this has nothing to do with logic. In order to explain what what is happening say with the magnetometer as it interfaces with a magnetic field we have to make assumptions about reality we have no first point of knowledge so we at some point you're always going to have to make an assumption about reality and and it just totally depends on the assumptions that you want to make all i'm saying is that when you make assumptions that are definitions they should be able to be used consistently it's not a logical system it's just assumptions are just statements that we're taking at face value for the purpose of understanding your proposal. Once we understand your proposal, that's it. The rational scientific method is done. We're not trying to prove it's correct. We're not saying it's true. We're not saying we know it. We're just saying, do you understand it? Do you understand the mechanism? Great, that's it, finished. I, I don't think that there, when I was reading about the ropes hypothesis though, it wasn't explaining the mechanisms really in detail. Like we're invoking these ropes apparently that can pass through each other <laughs> um, but we're not, <laughs> we're not really explaining like at the base level, like why, how are the ropes, how are the ropes attached? What are they made out of? Um, like what, uh, also even when you talk about objects and shape, what is, what is shape? Like you're kind of assuming that, that things can be sectioned off neatly from the rest of space, but really like atoms kind of flow in and out and you know when i touch my fingers together they're not actually touching if you zoom in too far like they, things are a lot fuzzier than i think you're trying to make them out to be even if we're just looking through a microscope i think your fingers do touch when they touch each other they say they don't because they talk about forces this is another example of reification um but under the rope model those surfaces of those atoms are making physical contact um, but, like, you know, take something like water, you know, we, you jump into a pool of water, it seems like it's a continuous substance, but if we zoom in, let's say we had God's eye view, we zoom in far enough, those, mole those molecules do have space as their immediate background. They, 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 they have shape, at least under 
my contention, and they have space. If they didn't have space, they wouldn't be able to move with respect to one another. Uh, in fact, in the entire right, so history- Right, I mean they're not touching? All right, I guess the, the ropes are what's in making case, it. In that, in that case, they're not touching, but they're, they're connected by ropes. But in, in the entire history of, of thought, of physics, they, you can essentially categorize every single theory into one of two camps in very generalized terms. And that would be particles on one hand and fields on the other or aether, excuse me, aether, particles and ether, whereas particles and the kind of opposites, particle, and this, these both go back to ancient times, particles, you have these little islands, these little blobs of matter that are separated by the void, by space. And so they can move around with respect to each other. And on the other hand, you have ether, which is supposed to be some kind of continuous, all pervasive medium that goes in all directions, that has no spaces or voids within it. So it's not like the water where you have uh, this, discrete objects that are separated by the void so they can move with respect to each other. It's just a continuous medium. And the problem with both of these, with particles, you can't explain attraction. How does one particle act on another across a distance without an intervening object? And with ether, you can't explain motion because you don't have any voids or spaces, no spatial separation. Things can't move with respect to each other. So everywhere that you look at physics, even in modern physics today, Einstein has a speech in 1920, ether and the theory of relativity. He just resurrected ether. He reified the concept of space, treats it as a physical object that can warp and bend and twist and contort. And when you look at quantum mechanics, you have the standard model uh, particles. There's particles. You have the quantum field theory. That's essentially aether. We still have the same two basic ideas in terms of how we're physically interpreting things. Rope hypothesis is a third a third possibility, interconnection. Okay. To get back to philosophy a bit, Dave, why don't we maybe try to list some of the assumptions that you and the rational, let's say, that you make about reality? Well, and, and I, I wanted to just interject um, that uh, it, it, it seems like when we talk about the rational scientific method, we're talking, we're kind of conflating a couple of things. We have the the sort of the, the the base rules like this you know definitions should be consistent and stuff like that and then we have the kind of stuff that has emerged from the process of working with that for a bit which seems to be this gates definition or gates definition of um you know an object is this and you know uh and you know things are things are interconnected with ropes and there's stuff that kind of emerges out of that and it kind of reminds me of like um you know like the, the bitcoin protocol right there's these rules that that um sort of determine how the blockchain is going to develop but then you have the actual blockchain that got developed and so i feel like th this is all getting kind of conflated together a little bit in that like i i see i see a lot of merit in the kind of more base level stuff and the stuff that seems to have kind of spun out of that later uh, is kind of, I'm kind of like, well, why, why, would, you, why would you necessarily pick those definitions, you know, and, and why would you never necessarily come up with, with that particular model? Uh, why ropes, you know? Um, yeah. So let's start with axioms. Like, what are the axioms of the rational scientific method, Dave? I wouldn't say there are any axioms. I'm saying these are critically reasoned criteria that are necessary for providing what you can, explanations that we can understand, mechanisms. Um, so I, I don't, I don't it's, not, it's not a logical system uh, because we're talking about reality and I don't think you, you can explain reality with logic because you have to make assumptions about reality, about existence. I, I think you're definitely reality? hurting your case <laughs> by, saying, by saying that it's not a logical system. If it's not a logical, I mean, what do you mean it's not a logical system? I mean, that just makes it sound- well, I mean, uh, no better than any other random. Can, can you can you define logical. reality? Because you didn't like it when I defined existence using the word reality. I would say existence and reality are synonyms. So I would define reality in the same way. Reality is that with shape and location. Reality is that with shape and location. Yes. So space is not a part of like reality. So motion right. isn't a part of motion isn't a part of reality. In the strictest sense. No, but if you want to well, say, I, 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 I think that's a you're useful talking definition. about strict sense, right? You're all about strict sense, clear uh, definitions, so non that's not, a useful, yeah. that's not a useful definition of reality because that allows that that doesn't allow us to be able to talk about motion or, or space and like a shape implies a medium. If you're talking about an object having shape and having borders, then it it implies the medium. And if if you're not going to say that the medium is part of reality, 
then okay, what word are you going to say that the medium is part of to, to make it clear that the medium is not imaginary? Well, I don't think space is a medium. That's, that's the main, that's what they, they describe it as a medium. They've converted it into ether when they do that. They're treating it as an object. It's not a medium. It's, it's nothing. Um, the, the so, or whatever you want to say. Yeah, pursuant to the definition of exist. And I see what you're driving at with-, okay, with Can you um, have more space or less space in between two objects? There's just nothingness in between them. They can get closer together and further apart. What does that mean? Just I mean yes, the spatial separation has has gotten short. Well, under what's what's the spatial hypothesis, separation? <laughs> under the rope hypothesis, it means that the length of rope between them is shorter. Really, under the rope hypothesis, you actually have lengths of ropes separating objects. But there's still there's still there's still uh, you know they still have space as their immediate background. But I'm just saying, if we say space exists, then we're saying it has shape and location pursuant to the definition. And or or maybe or maybe you should I mean, come up a with, a, with a definition that's more encompassing of, of the things that you need to talk about in order to explain physics. But Katie, it's isn't space really actually a lack of something? Isn't that what space yeah. is? You could consider it a lack of something. Um, that that's one definition but of it. Just, but then it, it kind of begs the question of like, how can we say that space is expanding? Uh, other people might I, talk more about space. I, as say that. I, I think it would <laughs> be useful know. to define something called know. conceptual existence, right? Like concepts that we can picture exist, but actually aren't there, or they're a lack of something. Is motion uh, just the, conceptual? The very I'm sorry. Is motion just conceptual? Oh no, I was, I was going to go back to that. If you if you want to, I'm fine with defining reality as that which occurs. If you want to if you want to go with that, Th things occur. I'm not trying to deny that or or, or have any issue with that. Yeah, I'm I think that's a, defin a better definition. Existence. That's fine. That's fine. I'm fine with that, and I see what you're driving at. Um, and I wouldn't disagree with that. If you want to say, we could say reality is, it, it includes motion or that, you know, occurrence, uh, because things obviously occur. Let's hope so, because that's an integral part of, of proposing explanations. And then once we start Very talking about motion and occurrence, we need to start talking about time. How, how does time oh. fit in with, with the, the ropes hypothesis or, or kind of the, the model of, of reality that you're working with? So, I mean, there's really, uh, I think two different conceptions of time among others. And one of those is a qualitative conception of time, like a sequence of events. Something happens before, and then something happens after, and something happens after that. And then you have a quantitative notion of time, which resolves to a comparison between motions. And uh, in practice, what that means is a comparison between a motion that has a great degree of regularity and some other motion. Like I, I compare the ticks on my watch to you running the 10 meter dash, or I compare the revolutions around the sun to my biological processes, we call that age. So all of these different instances of time, they always resolve to some comparison of motions. And with atomic clocks, they're talking about pumping of a cesium-133 atom compared to whatever. Uh, motions only really make sense if you're talking about them over time, right? Well, time is actually a concept built from the concept of motion. I, I think it's the I other know. way around. So, it's, it's, so. it's really tricky. It's, it's really tricky. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm not trying to say that I have the answers. I'm just trying to say that I think that you guys are constructing a really oversimplified world. It is a simplified world because I like, I like simple. But, but uh, to it's, answer your question, uh, it, it requires, since I said time was a comparison of motions, at least two motions, time, then the concept of time requires a bare minimum of two motions, whereas motion is the change of location of one object against all others. It's changing location of an object. And well, that and changing over time, right? Because... So motion is this, is this concept which is built from the concept of location and object, right? And time sure. is another concept which is built upon the definition of motion. Exactly. That makes sense to me. But uh, could you have motion in a, in a timeless world? I, I think they're kind of both mutually defined based on each other because if something is moving, like it was this way and now it's this way and, and we, have to, we have to invoke now in order to say it was this way 
And now it's this way. We're, we're referencing time to talk about motion at all. And we're, we're also referencing motion to talk about time. Yeah, I think you're invoking the, the qualitative notion of time there, the sequence of events before and after. Um, so that's another way that, that time is, is conceived of. But, okay. That's Could interesting. You... So you're saying the classical notion of time is basically a conflation of two different things. Yeah, I think there's, there's two different things packed in there. There's the sequence of events before, after, past, now. Because I, I think that, that that actually really clears things up because whenever I've thought, I thought about like the, you know, the, the birthday paradox, I'm sure you've heard of this, where, you know, one, one, you know, they take two twins and they ship one away at, at high speed um, and, you know, near the speed of light and one, one twin ages, you know, much faster than the other or something like that. And they bring them back together and one's like way older than the other. Um, it, it, yeah, that always, I could never figure out how to properly conceptualize that problem. <laughs> Yeah, and all, all you have to ask there is how many times did the Earth go, go around the sun? How many times? Because they're essentially uh, rejecting objective reality there when they say that. Because the Earth went around the sun a certain amount of times by the time when they separate from each other, right? And he's going at the speed of light or whatever's happening, and then he comes back and one's older or whatever. By the time he gets back, by the time he leaves and by the time he gets back, how many times did the Earth go around the sun? It didn't go around the sun a different amount of times for either person. It, it went around the sun a certain so amount are you, of times. Are you saying that just that wouldn't happen? Are you saying that like the birthday paradox would just literally not happen? Like they'd both be the same exact age when, when you brought them back together? Well, it depends on how you're defining age. I think what he's saying is that no matter – if you send the one away going really fast and he, he ages way faster, um, meaning like his, his cells have degraded way faster and like more time seems to have passed like relatively from his perspective – when he gets back, the Earth has still only gone around the sun the same amount of times. Wait, yeah, so and what, do you think, do you think special relativity would occur, Dave? What, they're to, yeah, what you're talking about there is time dilation. And there's two different kinds of time dilation. There's gravitational time dilation and relativistic time dilation. And I think what's happening with both of these, uh, all, all those different mechanisms, is that there's no such thing as time that is dilating. What is happening is that the clock, there, there is a reason that a clock in a high altitude in space is ticking at a slightly different rate than the clock on the Earth. It's just the clocks are ticking differently. In fact, every clock in the universe is going to tick at a slightly different rate simply because it occupies a different location, has a different gravitational potential, and it has a different motion. So let's say we have a clock way out there in space. It's at a high altitude. We've seen guys on the International Space Station with their hair floating up everywhere, and they put, put liquid out of, the, uh, of a bag and floats all over the place. Why should we expect the clock in that environment to tick at the exact same rate, especially when we're talking about an atomic clock? That, that's a cesium atom pumping. So if there's lower gravitational stresses on that, those atoms at this really high altitude in space, it's going to tick a little bit faster. And it's going to get out of line with that, that clock that's on the Earth that's experiencing surface gravity. Likewise, with relativistic time dilation, it's a velocity-based mechanism. So the closer that you travel, say, to the speed of light, the faster that something's traveling, that can also have some impact on the clock mechanism. And that causes it then to, for whatever reason, tick more slowly and also get out of alignment with the clock that's stationary on the Earth. They're, okay. just, they're in different physical situations, so the clock's going to tick different. Okay, so, 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 so basically what you're saying is, you know, we could, we could picture a situation where we put an astronaut in orbit and we stick him with an atomic clock. We have another atomic clock on the surface of the Earth. We orbit him enough times so that he becomes, you know, 50 years older than his twin on the Earth or something like that. And then, uh, you know, or, or according to, you know, modern physics, you know, we, we, we put him up there long enough to notice basically a major difference in their, in their age. And then, you know, we, we bring the guy in orbit down to the earth and we put the put the two guys next to each other his atomic the, the the you know the guy who was in orbit his atomic clock is going to say that 50 years more have passed than you know the guy on the earth um but like will they look will they look the same age i guess is my question because they'll have 50 years difference according to the atomic clock they'll have 50 years a difference according to the atomic clock but unless unless Living in that kind of environment ages you more quickly. Living in a zero-g environment, maybe because your atoms uh, are, are pumping more quickly because there's less gravitational stress on them. And if that, like, for whatever reason, causes you to age more, 
then maybe, but it's, it's not because of time dilation. I would think they're going to look exactly the same. Um, okay. It's just that the clocks got out of alignment. Okay, so basically okay. what you're saying is, is in orbit, the cesium clock is basically just wrong. Because, because the astronaut is not experiencing time any differently from the astronaut, right. from, from his twin right. on the Earth. Okay, so they, they, come back, they come back together and they just, you know, carry on like, like nothing happened, right? They'd be like, you know, we're the, we, we have the same exact length of life experience, you know, as, as seen by, by us. So you're basically, you're denying yeah. special relativity. I'm not what I'm what I'm rejecting are is their explanation. I'm not disagreeing with the phenomena that clocks get out of alignment. I'm disagreeing that it, it's due to something called time dilation. You're saying it's a measurement error, basically. It's kind of like it's what 19th century error. scientists said before Einstein. No, I'm saying that their explanation is irrational. That that saying time dilation doesn't really actually mean anything. It doesn't actually explain the discrepancy. I'm saying the, dis the discrepancy has nothing to do with so-called time dilation, whatever that means. It, it purely has to do with the clocks ticking at different rates because they are experiencing, they're in radically different environments and that causes them physically to tick at different rates. Yeah, I mean, you have to admit that, that at least in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in this basic case, that that's about, it, it's, it's as good of an explanation as like, like either there's something going on with time or there's something going wrong with the instruments. And it sounds like the rational people are just, you know, uh, saying that it's something wrong with the instruments. Or self you, self something, self self defined, ra self defined rational people, let's say. It's, yeah. um, it's, not, well, sure. it's not exactly yeah, that rational. something wrong with Indeed. the instruments because it depends how you define a second. Like is a second a part of a day on earth? In which case the, the atomic clock in going out into space is definitely wrong because it's not keeping the correct time according to the time on earth or right. are you saying that time is actually uh the, a second is actually the certain amount of emissions of this cesium molecule in which case both clocks are correct yeah no kurt that's exactly right you we have to arbitrarily choose an atomic clock i think it's in zurich switzerland maybe there's one that we choose and we say that's the right one all the other ones are wrong and we arbitrarily have to choose one because they all get out of alignment with each other simply because they occupy different locations in the universe and they have different motions. I'm, I'm going to cut off this discussion. Like basically the evidence for special relativity doesn't actually have to do with um, the clocks. It predated people going to space. It was Einstein that came up with it after observing that the speed of light is constant, going, whether it's coming, going, going away from us or coming towards us. You would explain that with the ropes. I will let the audience decide which explanation is more is more convincing. But I'd like to really get back to the ontology of your philosophy here, because you said earlier that you don't feel that this philosophy, this belief system has any axioms, that it's kind of self-evidently true. So I guess I want to kind of dig into that a little bit more. Like, like you're saying basically the, the world, you, you experience that you information through your senses, that information tells you with complete self-evident certainty that the world is made of objects before you. I, I want to dive into that a little bit more. Sure, and this is a, this is a great point. Um, I'm not saying that it's self-evidently true. I'm not using the terms truth, belief, proof, uh, knowledge, fact. I'm, I'm casting all of those out. I'm saying, I'm, I'm using the term assumption. So we don't know. I'm not saying this is self-evidently true. It's the truth, anything of that nature. I'm saying we have no choice but to make assumptions. You can make whatever assumptions you want but we have no choice but to make assumptions. And an assumption is simply a statement that we take at face value temporarily for the purpose of or developing and understanding a theory. Okay, fair enough, but you seem to have chosen certain assumptions for a reason. True, yes. And I would say the reason for that is, is as, as Chris mentioned earlier, that when he said that there seems to be something sort of outside uh, like multiple levels to what's going on here. There's like the criterion for an objective de definition, and then there's the definitions being proposed. And I would completely agree with that characterization. So the next question then is, uh, first of all, if we're gonna have uh, the, key, the key terms of your theory, object exists and everything else, the key terms of your theory that make or break your theory, um, that if we interpreted in them in a different way, it would completely change the meaning of your theory. Those terms, what is the objective criterion for a definition of those terms? That's the next step to figure out. What, what would we consider to be an objective criterion? And I can give you the six criterion that are typically outlined. Some people will say, well, it's in a dictionary. Well, as we discussed earlier, you know, 
multiple definitions for every word in a dictionary that just documents common usages. That's not scientific. Sometimes they'll say, okay, common usage. Again, that doesn't mean that the terms are being used consistently. Some people say they have to be experimentally determined. Some people say based on authority or they say we agree on the definition or the list examples without really defining the term. Um, so the, the question, I think the next question is to pit, to, to determine what is the objective criterion for a scientific definition? Okay, well, how, how, how could there be an objective criterion for, for language? Okay, the way I see language, it's like, it's, it's sounds that we're making to try to communicate with each other. And some definitions are better than others because they convey ideas more accurately. And I do agree that like in a scientific context, especially having definitions that are used consistently is a good thing because that way we'll understand them better. But it isn't, how is, how is it objective? Like it's inherently subjective or, or it sounds to me like there's this. That, that Kurt has used where it's like, there's, there's not a right or wrong definition. It's, it's just, are for, we for, understanding each other? That, that's, that's the point, right? From my understanding of the rational scientific method, there's this process of rational discourse, which determines how objective something is, right? If you use a term and everybody misunderstands you, then that's a bad term. If you, if you use a term, like it, it, there's kind of a trial and error process here, right? Am I right, Dave? Okay, Dave, how do you define the word objective? So I would say objective in this context really resolves to killing the observer in a scientific context. That's really what we have to do is kill the observer because we're talking about reality as it is independent of observers. That's what I mean by objective. So when because you say an observer, an observer introduces subjectivity. So when you say we're trying to come up with an, obje an objective criterion for performing science, you're basically saying we're trying to come up with a way to figure out what objective reality is like independent of an observer. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I, I have a, a problem with this because you're saying that your goal is to kill the observer, but yet one of the main big tenets of your philosophy is you have to be able to imagine it. Like a, a lot of the whole point of the rational scientific method and the ropes hypothesis and why you like it better than mainstream physics is because you can imagine it and like that's that's a, as subjective of a of a thing that i can as i can think of yeah so we have to make a distinction there when i say kill the observer i mean the empirical observer i mean your senses your sensory system i can't see an atom but i can imagine its structure i can't see you know the galaxy that's way far beyond the visible universe but i can imagine it existing i'm talking about killing the empirical observer the measure and thinking and, and talking about reality as it is not as we measure it or not as it appears to us through a sensory system or whether it's contingent whether we can we can detect something or not but as we can conceive of it so i'm making a distinction between the, the intellect and our conceiving abilities and our sensory system. Yeah, that makes sense. So you're, so you're basically you're saying an assumption of your system is that there is a reality, it exists independent of any observer, and the best way to try to figure out what it's like is to visualize it using our human visual system. In effect, yes. Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why would that be the best way to conceive of reality, though? Because I don't know of any other way to conceive of it. If you're, when you're in, in, in a consistent sense, and if somebody can come up with a definition of existence that we can all interpret and understand in the exact same way without, without it resolving to, to being a syn purely a synonym or to being circular or to being, or to being contradictory or to being extremely ambiguous, then I'm, then I'm all ears. But I, I think that a definition has to satisfy those criteria. And the only way to do that is the most objective form of communication is drawing a picture for somebody. And that's really like, if I'm gonna tell, if I, if I showed up here and I had scrapes and bruises all over me and you said, what happened? When I explain what happened, I'm gonna give you a story about how I got in a car accident. Well, you can imagine the car, you can imagine the road, they all have shape. We do this so often that we don't even think about it. It's so natural and inherent to us to understand and, that's, and explain things in this way. Um, I'm just saying, let's make it explicit. This is how we understand reality. Just because, it's how it, we, just, because, just because it's how we understand reality doesn't mean it's more representative of what objective reality is like. Like if we were super intelligent dogs having the dog podcast, we would say, 
clearly the most objective way to communicate is through smell. I smell, you smell, <laughs> we paint, you know, the landscape of the smells. It's what objective reality is like. Come on, guys. I mean, honestly, yeah. Like if dogs could talk, they probably have like really complex smells that they would invent words for. And they would all be thinking of the same exact smell when any of the dogs said that word. But it wouldn't mean that scent is the best way to conceive of, of reality in the physical universe. Or the best no, way for humans to do it, right? Yeah. So that's why, why, would you, why would you want the best way? You want the best way that's possible. Well, well be, <laughs> because just the we're, best we're, way. Yeah, but well, try, trying sense? to be what able to sense? understand the most about the universe as, as possible, as it is, not as we perceive or conceive of it, which is I, tricky, I'll admit. I mean, but. I mean, Dave is trying to ontologically privilege sight and visualization above all other forms of gaining knowledge or building conceptual models. And I, for, to me, that seems extremely limiting because sight and visualization are only two of several mechanisms that we can use. So I don't, I don't understand why we'd artificially limit ourselves or say that or privilege those with like an ontological status above all others. Ontological means um, re re description of reality. What other, what other, should you give an example of another way in which you would understand, and I'm talking specifically about assumptions about how reality is when you say something exists. Give me another example besides an object with structure. What other example would you have to to make assumptions about how reality is? I wouldn't necessarily say assumptions. I would say model building because I think it's post assumption. I, I think it's, it's, it's the assumption, the assumption is, is more basic than what we're talking about here, but I, I would say metaphor, concept, concept building, mathematics. Metaphor. Like we've already given it, we've already, we've already, we've already given, let, shh, shh, once, let me finish. Sorry. We've already given an example. Okay. We've already given an example of how you can use, um, concept building, projection, and mathematics to create a concept and to understand fourth dimensional objects, even though we can't visualize them using specifically our visual cortex. Okay, so the example is fourth dimensional objects. Yeah, we've already talked about it a lot. Oh, I'm sorry, we already, we've talked, already talked about, about it a lot. I mean, well, it, 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 I will admit it does become trickier to, to nail down concepts when they're not 3D objects because that's what we, that, that's how our bodies are, are tuned to interact with the universe. Um, but, but I mean, I, everything, that, everything that physicists talk about that you guys object to would be an example of that, like fields, like energy, like force, like. You can also get into stuff like, like justice, or concepts or metaphors, the whole humanity's side of existence yes but, but the, I, I do think that there's a good idea I, I think it is a good idea to separate like things like justice from things like physical things yeah you wouldn't say that justice slammed into love and they exploded you wouldn't say that literally i wouldn't say you know i take psychedelic drugs and my mind expands i don't mean it literally no, because, I don't, because I don't have a mind. literal definition of existence like you do yeah no, but, i don't have a literal ex definition of existence like you do so i wouldn't Right, but okay. Would you ever would you ever explain something by saying justice expanded and crashed into love? This is metaphorical language. Uh, we have to speak literally in science. What are you saying exists literally? Does justice exist, or is it an abstract concept? Justice is an abstract concept. There are humans in the world. We relate to each other in various ways, and justice is an abstract concept that can encompass that. But it's not a thing. It's not literally a thing to describe it as existing is, is, a, is to commit the fallacy of reification. You're treating a concept There's a difference between, li between li liter literal and physical. There's a difference between literal and physical. Well, I'm saying, well, so I'm what? saying science, you, when you're making an assumption, you need to be literal. You can't be metaphorical about yeah, reality. It makes sense. If you want to try to describe the physical world, you should talk about physical, tangible, or, you know, physical yeah. things. We, 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 don't, we don't need to go off on this tangent, yeah, but the point is that there's things that aren't physical that, I mean, I would say exist, but maybe we can stick to an example like a fourth dimensional yeah, object what, or like a photon. What does that have to do with physics? The more interesting thing here is, is things like things like energy or, or things like, um, yeah, I mean, things like, things like energy, things that, that don't have shape, things that 
things that flow rather than I'll give you, I'll give you a, a, a quote you know, uh, a quote from Richard Feynman um, on energy and it says it is important to realize that in physics today we have no knowledge of what energy is we do not have a picture that energy comes in little blobs of a definite amount. It is not that way. However, there are formulas for calculating some numerical quantity. And when we add it all together, it gives, quote, 28, always the same number. It is an abstract thing in that it does not tell us the mechanism or the reasons for the various formulas. So we have energy. So, so, so that's abstract. true. And we're, we're, it's okay to admit that we, that we don't fully understand how these things work. Even if we're talking about something like the ropes hypothesis, you, you would still, I know you guys don't, but still at some point, wouldn't you need to talk about things like energy and force? Because like, if you're talking about a rope pulling on a thing, why is it that these physical objects interact in this way? And like, if something moves this fast and it hits it this hard, like, why is it What's, what's the mechanism, what's actually going on there that causes these things to collide and, and explode in these ways and not in other ways? Like we could imagine universes where it took a lot more force for me to knock over a cup than it does in, in this universe. Uh, don't you still have to talk about those things? Sure, yeah, there's a lot left to explore in that regard, but I, I think that the main thing with this, this approach is that there are only two forces in this rope hypothesis universe or rational scientific method ideology, if you want to call it that, is push and pull. There's surface to surface contact, there's push uh, at the atomic level, and there's pull, tension or pull on a rope or whatever. Only push and pull. So I know, and I know you guys wouldn't want to say that push and pull exist um, based on your definition of existence, but wouldn't you agree that it would still be useful to define them and like use them as as variables and and make calculations with them to try to figure out how these objects are interacting with each other yeah you can you can do that if you want to make predictions but i don't i and and let me also say this that that the mathematical side does provide clues newton's equation pro definitely provides clues as you know the fact that there's no time factor and and the distance squared and the multiplying of the masses, the, the, the mathematical side does provide a set of clues and therefore can be useful, useful when trying to formulate a better understanding on the physical side. I would agree with that. Here's a question that I had when I was reading your paper, Dave. Um, do you feel that the best models should be constrained? Do you feel that, that your model should be constrained by these mathematical equations and by the the evidence that's been gathered? I, you know, it depends because like I said earlier, some of the, the math is so, so convoluted uh, that how, how, how do you really connect in, in the dots on that? But I think for the major things, it, sh it should be able to explain the evidence. First and foremost, we should be rational, but yeah, it should be able to explain basically gravity, light, electricity, and magnetism. Okay, what, what, okay. You, you really like clarity and lack of ambiguity. So what is the clear criterion you're using for deciding which mathematical equations are gonna, are gonna constrain your model and which aren't? Huh. Great question. That is a good question. Which ones, are, well, I don't think, <laughs> first and foremost, I think that the, the explanation has to be rational. That's the first thing, and that's how I'm distinguishing it it's not actually part of the rational scientific method to invoke evidence. All we're doing is providing explanation. We're providing proposals. All you get is the mechanism. Uh, outside of that, yeah, we want to compare it to the evidence because we want to understand what we're seeing and measuring and observing. I guess I, I can't say off the top of my head what would, what would qualify in that respect. You would have to take each one on a, on a case by case so, basis. So, so basically so you, get to, you get to cherry pick which evidence and which equations you wanna use to support your theory and you can just dismiss arbitrarily the ones you don't wanna apply. Uh, not necessarily. I mean, I mean <laughs> what I'm saying, I mean, when you get into the standard model of particle physics, okay, they're describing a world where there are 17 elementary particles. Yes, the rope hypothesis should account for that same phenomenon. Now, whether every variable in there is going to correspond to something in the rope hypothesis, probably not. 
but in general, it should account for the same thing. But it's not going to be as mapped on as, say, with, with Newton's equation, where I can actually understand the physical meaning of ma mass 1 times mass 2 all over d squared. I can understand the gravitational constant. But what they're describing, the patterns that they are describing should be explainable using the rope hypothesis. So, so I, I think an, an, important, an, an important point is that, like, some models are better than others. And there needs to be a criterion for measuring which models are better than others. And I think the assertion of the rational scientific method is that the current way of doing things is inferior in some way, and the new way of doing stuff should produce better results, right? What I'm, well, the first and foremost, the rational scientific method is about distinguishing theories which are intelligible, which we can actually understand from those which we cannot. So it's a purely explanatory thing, it has nothing to do with the evidence has nothing to do, we can, we can distinguish two theories outside of any considerations of evidence based upon whether or not they are rational. All right, but, but, but so, so basically what you're drawing, you're drawing kind of an arbitrary line between things that you can't understand and things that you can understand, right? Because clearly some physicists understand this stuff and you know, the, the average layman probably doesn't though. And so maybe this, this new way of visualizing things is more useful for the average layman to, to um, sort of work with, um, but I'm, I'm sure there would be people sort of like deeper into physics, you know, way high up at the research levels who would disagree that the simpler model is, is better. And they, and they might, yeah, but, and, they might and they might say, well, what are you talking about? My, my, you know, my, my model is totally rational. You know, it makes sense to me and it makes sense to all my, you know, uh, coworkers who, who I'm working with on this research project or whatever, you know. You know, I would I assume earlier, that the universe is pretty oh, complicated, sorry. right? I, I was just going to say, I would, assume that, I would assume that the universe is, is probably pretty complicated and that the nature of, of atoms and the relationships between objects or, or fields or things that aren't objects, whatever, are, are pretty complex and would take years of study and, and would... I, I don't know why we would think that, that simpler would be better. I'm not saying it is better. I, I think the universe is complicated. I mean, it's not a matter of simplicity. It's a matter of ability to rationalize and or not rationalize. I give you, I talked about what Brian Cox said earlier. He can't, one of the smartest physicists in the world, apparently, he can't imagine, he can't picture higher dimensions. He admits that. Quantum, uh, Feynman's famous quote on quantum mechanics. I think I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. Uh, I don't think that any amount of mathematical training suddenly gives you the ability to conceive something that we cannot conceive of that we cannot imagine. It is a, it's, a, it's something inherent to our minds as human beings, the human species. We cannot picture, we cannot imagine, we cannot conceive of these things. And the reason that we cannot is because they're talking about abstract mathematical concepts. Right, but what I'm saying is clearly some people can picture those, just not maybe you and I don't me. Think that, well, no, maybe they can't picture them, can. but that's okay. I don't see why being able, humans being able to picture something is a, a criteria for whether it, it is like, useful information for whether it could possibly be real or not. Also, okay, this is kind of a wacky direction to take this, but I, I don't know many physicists who can say that they can picture multiple dimensions, but I, most people I know who have taken DMT have had experiences that aren't, are not three-dimensional. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all I'm saying, and this goes back to the middle world thing with, with Richard Dawkins, you know, where he says, we evolved at the macroscopic scale. Why should we automatically say, maybe the universe works in mysterious ways, and I'm fine with that. All I'm saying is that we still, if we're talking about explanation, the whole point of an explanation is that it, it makes sense to us. It explains something to us. We understand something better. That's what an explanation is. And if it does not un enhance our understanding, then it is simply not an explanation. We don't achieve a better understanding. Now, maybe uh, you could say this makes better predictions in mathematics. I'm fine with that. But we have an enhanced... But isn't that the only metric? Isn't that the only objective metric of whether our understanding has actually increased? Is like, like how, can, how can you say, oh, my understanding has increased by using this new model? Isn't it you apply it and try to make predictions and see if the predictions are better than you used to have? Yeah, I mean, maybe we have a better picture with this new model, but if it doesn't make great predictions, then we're just understanding something that, that's, that's false. Like we just constructed something pretty yeah, and like simple a fictional so that world. we can look at it and play it as a movie. Great, but... These are two radically different things. 
you're talking about with mathematics, you're talking about a description of what you observe. Mathematics does not say anything explicitly about existence. Mathematics does not say anything explicitly about objects. It cannot. Every single one of those variables resolves to a process of measurement. That's what they're mapping to these coordinates. That's what they're mapping mathematically to those locations. They're saying at this coordinate here, if you stuck your measuring device there, you would measure, for example, this magnitude and direction of, of uh, magnetism of a magnetic field that doesn't tell you what's physically interacting with your magnet with your magnetometer to produce that reading it's just telling you what you would measure it's totally just mapping measurements onto coordinates in order to engage in pattern recognition it works and it's useful but it does not tell you explicitly anything about the underlying phenomena and reality that is actually making these patterns happen that well, is that, the difference. That, it, it, it does it it lets you rule out certain kinds of explanations. It constrains the explanations you can have. Like if I had a description of reality that was like, um, what is it? Uh, say there's this equation, speed is uh, distance over time. If I was like, no, speed is five times distance over time, then you guys would probably be like, Ariel, that's not really a very strong understanding of reality or explanation. I think you should revise that. It's always making wrong predictions left and right. Like get it together, girl. Like like math constrains yeah. it constrains our field of of possible good explanations i i do think i do think dave has a point here though like math constrains and it describes but yeah it, it's true like us looking at the variables and, and seeing what happens and observing what outputs we get back when we measure things doesn't tell us like if it's a rope or if it's a flowing field or if it's a or if it's a whatever down there necessarily it, we have to construct model but but just imagining that it could be ropes doesn't seem to help with our understanding like maybe that's a possibility maybe it does actually work with all of the math and it's a possibility and it's it's, it's kind of nice but why ropes why not something else yeah, no, you, you could, you, you could totally, it's just one theory. In fact, there are so many problems with the rope hypothesis that, you know, people make little modifications to it. And, and, and so that, you know, you, you could come up with your completely, your whole own new model if you wanted to. But the point is that there's always going to be multiple possible explanations for any given body of evidence. And I'll agree with Ariel that, that uh, at least the way that I would express it is that um, mathematics provides a set of clues and to try to figure that out. But, um, but at the end of the day, it does not say anything directly and explicitly. It does not explicitly say anything about the underlying objects. It only says, all it says, maybe provides clues, uh, but it only tells us what we would measure at the different locations and the measurable patterns and doesn't say anything about existence. You have to make assumptions in order to do that. And why ropes? Yeah, you, well, you could, you could come up with another theory. The reason I like the rope hypothesis is because it, it, it's, it gets past the problems of particles where you can't explain attraction and ether where you can't explain motion. You have interconnection. And, and the thing is that with the rope, you know, you have one object that combines light and gravity with tension and torsion. And also because it's two threads wrapped around each other, that automatically gets you the basic architecture of the hydrogen atom, the proton and the electron. So all gravity, light, and the basic structure of the atom fall into place immediately with uh, a simple assumption. And Dave, I think there's probably things you can say in favor of the rope hypothesis or things that it kind of, you can make it describe atoms and stuff like that. But I, I guess where I see a difference here at a very basic level is I would say that a more valuable explanation and one that is more likely to give a better understanding is one that makes good predictions, is in line with a large amount of the evidence, is aligned with, the, aligned with these mathematical equations we've developed, whether or not it's visualizable. Whereas you would say, you would prioritize visualizability. You'd say, I would sacrifice the ability of the model to make good predictions the alignment of the model with the evidence and the alignment of the model with the mathematics if the model is visualizable that is more important and i i really deeply question that like I, I think it's a very questionable assumption and i think most people would agree at least mainstream the mainstream perspective would agree yeah but you look how many different they cover all their bases look at how many different physical interpretations they give on one hand they tell you everything is particles but then on the other hand well actually no it's all fields 
oh, well, then there's a conflict between quantum mechanics and relativity. Relativity is saying it's warped space time. And but then they, they tried to resolve those by coming up with string theory. So, so that now, now that's a one dimensional string extended, extended in three dimensional space. They don't have any one consistent view or picture of reality. They, they, but, but they give that's you okay. one specific thing for each situation. So how can it be all those things at once? Okay. I think that physicists would admit that we, we don't have a universal theory of everything, but we're still trying to discover more and more like about, we're, we're trying to take more measurements so we can m make better predictions and construct a, a better and more useful model that gives us more understanding of, of what's going on. I, I don't think that having a, a pretty simple visual picture is, is that important. Like maybe it's personally satisfying to feel like, yes, I finally understand what's down there and it's ropes. It satisfies yeah. some, some curiosity, but how useful is that really? Like if there's no math related to it, we don't know like how the ropes actually affect each other. Like what are the details of this, this torsion? Like, okay, great. But I, I think it's okay that physicists don't have a, a perfectly consistent model. I think that, and I think that they would admit that and, and do admit that. Yeah, I think it's in line historically with how things have tended to go. Like often we've come up with things or there have been discoveries where the path to that discovery isn't always totally clear or some of the basic, like with Galileo, like this philosopher of science, Fairband, likes to point out that in Galileo's time, a lot of the opti like optical science wasn't at the point where Galileo could really explain from first principles what he was seeing. And that was a big part of the church's argument against him is that he was making all these claims, but can you define all your first principles and show us the clear, how, where everything derives from? He couldn't, but he was still right. And it was still valuable that Galileo did what he did. Mm -hmm. Dave, can you respond more directly to Ariel's criticism? Like, would you, if, if you had an idea which didn't fit the evidence and, and the maths didn't back it up, but it was really easy to visualize, would, would you take the easy one to visualize or would you say, well, no, we got to go back to the drawing board? If there was something that, that just blatantly went against uh, what could be, what you could explain, then I would think you would have to go back to the drawing board. But I want to be very clear about something to reiterate. The rational scientific method doesn't get into evidence. This is sort of a separate thing. All it, all it is is a, is a set of criteria for proposing an explanation. And when, when I'm coming up with an explanation, of course I'm going to use evidence in order to brainstorm. But when we're at the science conference and I'm presenting it to you, I don't have to uh, usher in a single piece of evidence from the beginning. All you have to say is, let us assume this exists. Let us suppose that this is how it interacts. Then I'm going to explain why they behave the way they do in terms of their structure. Then after that, we can approach the evidence. And, and from that point of view, we're stepping outside of the rational scientific method. And I would say, yes, if there was something that is just so blatantly, you know, cannot be explained, uh, then we, we would go back to the drawing board. And there's, and there's plenty of things we can talk about in the rope hypothesis where, you know, like, like, for example, Chris brought up earlier with the unwinding of the magnetic thread and how does it rewind? And there's all kinds of issues that are there uh, with it. I'm not, I'm not saying by any means that it is, is this perfect answer to everything. It, it, is, it is like a first step in, a, in, a, in, in trying to achieve a different uh, unique picture that has not been thought of before. But it is by far from, from perfect. And I'm sure there's so all kinds of problems I haven't even thought of with it. Hmm. So it kind of sounds like evidence is a part of the rational scientific model, but but it's not a not a direct or not a, not something that's at the forefront. Not it's not strictly a part of the rational scientific method. All rational scientific method is hypothesis, theory, conclusion. The hypothesis is the first frame of the movie. It's where you give the objects the definitions and how those objects are spatially related to one another. It's like the first frame of the movie you're about to show me. The theory is the rest of the movie, how the objects behave, and also your explanation for why those objects are behaving the way that they are in terms of their structure. Once that ends, the conclusion is, we argue about whether or not it's rational. We argue about whether or not ropes passing through each other, is that rational? Um, and then you come to a conclusion, is it rational, yes or no? After that, the rational scientific method is done. It's simply about distinguishing rational theories from irrational ones. 
So you could use so, the rational scientific method as part of a greater method of science, like as part of the scientific method in general. What, what are you forming your hypothesis and theory based on, if not the evidence? You are, so, so what I'm saying is that during the, 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 pro, the brainstorming phase of coming up with the theory, you're inevitably going to use evidence. Bill Gady never could have come up with the rope model if he hadn't sat there and studied physics. He had to study the evidence, evidence of the last 400 years to be able to come up with it. Never, he never would have come up with it. What I'm saying is that once you've brainstormed it, once you've got it laid down, once you, you go to the science conference, the first thing that you do is say, let us suppose that this exists and let us suppose it behaves like this. Because if we cannot even understand what it is that you are proposing, it, it doesn't even make sense to compare it to the evidence because there's no way to explain the evidence if you, what you're saying is unintelligible. So, so just to clarify, so the, the comparing it to like the, the conclusion part of your movie where you argue about whether it's rational, that would be the part where you could bring in evidence and you could argue about, well, this evidence says this, so this is irrational. Or is, is that uh, right? In, the, in the, the way that it is conceived, that is where we're talking about things like the light on light problem. So that's not an evidence-based thing. We're just saying, well, how, how can ropes maintain their tension and yet seem to cut through each other? How can they cut through atoms uh, and and you know, I can walk through a room and not get all tangled up in ropes. Those would be the kinds of issues that you would be bringing up. You seem uh, to be, you seem to be, um, you seem to be saying that the rational scientific method is only about figuring out whether a system is rational and, and consistent, like within its own framework. You're only trying to figure out if, if the theory makes sense, like within its own constraints. Yes. Yeah. Like, does it make sense? And is it consistent? Okay. Does it make sense and is it consistent? Yeah, those are some yeah, those are some good criteria, but then also like does it actually map to reality? I think is the more important part of, of science and the scientific method. Would you agree? Well, the problem there is that any given body of evidence is always going to have multiple different possible explanations, and the thing is that ultimately it's going to resolve to what at best you can describe as scientific opinion, deciding between one theory over the other, um, at some point, you know, there, there's, it's, there's no other way to boil it down than, I think this explains this evidence better, and you don't. Um, and yes, there's, there's, to some extent, you can say, perform more experiments and provide more clues, and that'll impact how you brainstorm your theory. But the rational scientific method specifically simply has to do with the proposing of the theory and, and whether or not it is rational. You just said that like what you would try to do, what you'd be arguing about is I think this explains this evidence better, right? Yeah, so, after, after your science pr presentation is over and after everybody understands your proposal and we go out to the bar and have a beer, then we can talk about, okay, argue about which, which, which model do you think better explains the same body of evidence. But I think that Ultimately, what you'll find is that it resolves to what at best can be described as scientific opinion. So what you're saying yeah, is that that isn't part of science, like the part where we argue about which right, theory is actually better. Right, that's, that's, actually, that's actually not what scientists are doing. That's kind of what Christian medieval theologians were doing when they would go to the, the bar. They weren't really at the bar, but... They, you know, like how many angels can fit on the head of a pin? Well, if we define an angel this way, well, no, if an angel is a you know, particulate, like, that's the kind of discussions that they would have. What makes science different from that is science has the scientific method, which involves experimentation. Which is great for pattern recognition and for discovering patterns and then encoding those patterns into equations, which can be useful, which is a different, and it's a perfectly valid thing to do. I have no problem with this. Uh, it's a perfectly valid approach to science. Experiments aren't always about, they're, they're, Okay, but but what? Why? Okay, experiments aren't always about equations. There's anything wrong with equations, but experiments provide. Experiments allow us allow us to test our theories in a very controlled way. So they let it. You know, there's, there's certain assumptions behind experimentation, right? Like we have to make certain assumptions about how reality works. But experimentation allows us to test our theories and to control for variables that would extraneous variables that make it hard to figure out if we're just in a bar arguing how the evidence applies to our theories. Yeah, but how, how about this? Let me ask you this. 
the reason the reason that they talk about particles in fields all day long is because those are convenient for mathematics. If the laws, so-called laws of physics, were completely different, such that the the patterns of nature, the obvious regular patterns that we see in nature, were different than they are here, just uh, assuming that they were for a moment, you could come up with a, a a standard model of particle physics or a field theory that mapped onto that set of patterns. So what I'm saying is both particles in fields, as long as you can create as many elementary particles as you need and paint on as many parameters as you need onto them, is same thing with fields. Every elementary particle is an associated field. As long as you have as many fields as you need piled on top of each other with as many parameters as you need, they're infinitely flexible. And you can map that on to any conceivable set of empirical patterns. But does that, is that evidence then that particles and fields literally exist? See, this, is, this, is, this is the part that reminds me of John Searle's experiment, the, the Chinese room thought experiment, where uh, basically, the, have you thought of this? Have you heard of this? It's a, in the sort of artificial intelligence discussion. And anyway, the idea is there's, there's, a, like, there's a guy in a room and there are, he has this instruction book for converting, for, for translating uh, English instructions into, into Chinese. Um, or let's see, what is it? Anyway, the point is, the, the, the guy inside the room doesn't actually understand Chinese. He's just, uh, oh, here, sorry, sorry, no, I, I got that wrong. Uh, so, so somebody comes up to the, to the room, and they can't see in the room. They can't see it's a guy. It could be a computer. Or it could be a, you know, it could be a computer. Or it could be a guy. And they put in instructions in Chinese. And the guy doesn't understand Chinese. He just understands English. And he has an instruction book in English, which tells him what to do for every single possible input of Chinese. And so, so, so the, so, and then he, he, you know, outputs, you know, whatever the output is in Chinese, he doesn't really understand what's going on, but the person outside the room thinks that he understands, right? So it kind of, it's like this illusion that he actually understands when really he's just following instructions. And so it seems to me this argument about our understanding of physics is similar to that. It's like, well, you know, we have this kind of mapping that seems to kind of work, but it actually might not. And we'd have no idea. Yeah, the, the mapping works, but, but, but with particles and fields, you, you can map particles and fields onto any conceivable pattern that you can th throw at, at somebody. You can map mathematically particles and fields onto that and describe that pattern with particles and fields as long as you can have as many particles as you need with as many parameters as you need. So the fact that we have a standard model in our universe that uses on one hand, particles and quantum field theory that uses fields to map onto that set of patterns very, very accurately in order to make very, very accurate predictions does not mean that particles and fields exist. It's an ad hoc approach, um, but this is, this is essentially what they're implying. Right, yeah, that makes that's, sense. That's an interesting point um, to, to ponder, but I, I kind of wanted to go back to what you were saying about like what is and what isn't part of science. And when you were talking about these like hypothetical science conferences where you, you brainstorm based on evidence and then you get up and you present your theory and then you would just debate about the theory's internal consistency within itself. Like why, okay, one, why do you want to say that evidence has nothing to do with science? Like why, why do you want to define your terms in this way? Because it seems to, like evidence being a, a part of science is, a pretty important part of it if i think we both seem to agree like if you're trying to actually find out truth about reality then like gathering evidence is a really important step so why are you trying to divorce like experimentation and evidence gathering from the word science that seems really really strange okay and i'll and i'll i'll let's let's i'll back up and say i i won't try to divorce that from the word science what i'm saying is that there's, there's really two separate, two separate things going on simultaneously. And the current version of the scientific method, they sort of mix these together without clearly uh, uh, distinguishing them. So maybe in, instead of saying the rational scientific method is the scientific method, we, we just recognize the distinction between two radically separate things. On one hand, this evidence gathering and, and pattern recognition through measurement and experimentation. And on the other hand, when you make assumptions about reality in order to try to come up with a mechanism, an underlying physical mechanism that underlies the pattern, that they're simply two separate things. 
they're, they're completely distinguished. What do you think the relationship is between those two things, Dave? I think the extent of the relationship is that when you are brainstorming your theory, that you are inevitably be going to, you're going to be looking at the evidence without a doubt. Whenever I look at physics, whenever I think about physics, all I'm doing is going on Wikipedia and other places and looking at what experimentalists have done and looking at that stuff and trying to understand it better um, and, and the context of the rope model. So in, in that sense, you're always looking at the evidence. It's just the rational scientific method is, is deals strictly with the pro proposing of the theory. There, there is among physicists, there's a distinction. I mean, a, a lot of people do both, but there is definitely a distinction between experimental physicists and theoretical physicists. They, they have like a little bit of a rivalry between them. They like to poke fun at each other and argue about who's smarter and stuff like that. Like there, there is this distinction. Yeah, but when they say theoretical, they're, they're, in, they're thinking mathematically still. Well, yeah, because if, if you want to be able to analyze the evidence and like actually talk about the patterns of the data, then you need to be able to, to do math to properly an analyze evidence, especially evidence this complex. And I think it's a little bit, frankly, cocky that a bunch of people on the internet would think that they could come up with a better theory or explanation about what's actually going on if they can't understand math. And like how, how can they understand if their theory actually map, maps onto the evidence if they can't understand like the language that we use to interpret patterns? Yeah, that's I'm true. The, the rational science movement seems kind of like, well, we're really bad at math, so we're just <laughs> let's forget about math. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I wouldn't describe I'm not saying that, that. I'm saying that the math doesn't... <sighs> committing the fallacy of reification and saying higher dimensions exist, that's what doesn't make sense. And I'll, I'll stand by that. I don't think anybody can understand that. So it's not about understanding the math on a conceptual level. I'm not disputing the math. I said that at the beginning, I'm not disputing the math. I'm disputing that, that a mathematical concepts exist in reality or that anybody can understand what it would mean for them to exist in reality. And yes, maybe it is cocky for a bunch of know-nothings, amateurs, idiots to go on the internet and, and, and say that, you know, zero dimensional particles and warp space time and, and black holes and higher dimensions and all these things are essentially indistinguishable from traditional religion in the explanatory sense. Uh, but I like, I like the fact that I can picture the rope model. I can understand it. I can visualize it. I can visualize the mechanism underlying light, gravity, electricity, and magnetism. That's what I'm saying a physical explanation is. So I, I guess I don't know what more to add on top of that. One thing I would, one thing I would ask you, um, it's been on my mind for a little while is, would you, one thing you could add on top of that is, do you think there's value in subjecting your explanation to experimentation, to coming up with an experiment where one outcome would seem to imply the standard model, one outcome would provide evidence for the rope hypothesis and then to perform that experiment? Yeah, but you, you, you... <laughs> Eh, it, it's possible. Yeah, no, it's possible. Sure. Like, for example, you can perform the double slit experiment with a, uh, with a needle instead of a slit aperture. And uh, that arguably presents a problem for the, for quantum mechanical interpretation of, of, uh, of the double slit experiment. Um, yeah. But, cool. but I'd, love, I'd love to see that experiment. Method. Go to buy a laser and, and then get a needle and point it at the wall and you'll see the same interference fringe patterns as you would see uh, if you use two slits. Okay, so then you agree then that um, explanations that uh, produce correct predictions when subjected to experimentation are of better quality? What, I'm, what, what, I, what I will first say is that there are considerations that you have to make prior to evidence. There are considerations, that's the most important thing. There are considerations you make prior to a single shred of evidence. Rationality is prior to evidence. If something is not rational, you don't even walk into the lab because there's no point in walking to the lab because you're not gonna be able to explain what you're seeing in the lab if you cannot even understand the proposal. So that's, that's the first thing. But after 
for that. So, so it does it does seem to be like fundamentally fundamentally based on this philosophy or this idea that if we can't visualize it, if it's if it's not in three D, then it's impossible. If we can't wrap our heads around it, then it means that it, it couldn't be real. It, it means that we, it means we simply won't be able to understand the explanation, and we won't enhance our understanding of reality. Maybe there it, maybe reality is such a way that is beyond our understanding. I'll grant that. All that means is we're just going to be ignorant, and that's nothing we can do about it. But but I mean, you you can come to a point even if you can't visualize and understand fully and as intuitively as some things. You 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 can come to understand concepts that are outside of just just objects like you 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 can yes, it, it's you not can, impossible you, a lot of people do i'm sure that you could can you understand them existing because you're talking about concepts not 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 with shape and location in 3d space and in what way then in what way that's the question in what as way being, does a four-dimensional object reality exist? as being as being a part of reality. How, how does it interact with other objects in order to produce an explanation? How does a 4D warp space time keep the Earth in orbit around the sun? What is the process? It's, it's, it's interesting. It's, it's an interesting question to ask. And I think it deserves some, some exploration if, if our experiments are leading us to think that that might be an, an, av an avenue for a potential explanation. But the experiments don't lead. The interpretations lead. That's, sure. that's the thing. Yeah, the numbers can't lead you anywhere. They're just numbers. Well, 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 numbers numbers could lead you to a place where where there there were no patterns if you only had two or three axes, but there were patterns and equations that you could make if there were four or five or six axes. Num numbers can lead you there. Yeah, but uh, I mean, as long, I mean, if we can't un if we can't understand the associated explanation, if we can't rationalize it, then we we are not understanding what's physically happening. What is the underlying mechanism? Okay, um, I think we're going in circles a little bit. Um, this might be a good place to wrap up. Uh, I guess I'll open up the floor if anyone has any burning last comments, and then I'll give uh, I'll give Dave the the final word. Mm. Okay, so I guess my last comment would be, I, I think that Dave has a good point about, um, about you being able to have multiple models um, to, to fit the same math and that you, you could potentially have particles and, and fields like map onto any set of data. I think that is an interesting point. I don't think that the rational scientific method seems very rational. I think it's very, very limiting. And I think that to say that just because we can't understand something visually or fully or simply, we should throw it out and we'll just be ignorant and there's no point in even talking about it is, is very close-minded and, and would limit potential human knowledge quite a bit. And I, I wanted to have a final... It's, it's trying to say that theoretical physics is, uh, should be this way, right? Where we, it only proposes rational, you know, sounding ideas. And, um, and it's, it's saying that experimental physics is actually not physics and actually not science, um, which like I question the choice, uh, like why would you define, why would you just change the definition of science that's going to turn everybody off to, to the new system? Um, but yeah, it, it seems like a, as a replacement for theoretical physics, for coming up with theories, it, it seems pretty, pretty sound. Um, Dave, I think you have the floor. Okay, well, I mean, really to end it, first of all, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate the chance to try to explain this point of view. I recognize I am just some idiot on the internet that doesn't know anything. Uh, when I came across this stuff years ago, I was fascinated by it. I still am fascinated by it. And so uh, I enjoyed discussing it and I simply, I don't want to uh, try to convince anybody that I'm that this is the right way to go or whatever. And if nobody agrees with me, that's fine. Um, but what I what I like to do is I enjoy is the chance to simply spread awareness of it so people can decide for themselves whatever they think. It's just a, another point of view out there from pe for people to choose from. Um, but I I obviously I don't expect anybody to 
conform to this way of thinking at all. And I totally recognize there are legitimate issues, especially with the rope hypothesis. Um, and I guess that's all I have to say. Well, thank you. Th thank you so much for coming on, uh, David. We, we really did. Uh, well, I really enjoyed this discussion. I'm sure everybody else did too. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, so. David. It, it was a really interesting conversation. Um, I, I had a really good time. I think hopefully our audience did. We talked about some physics, some philosophy. We all explored some curiosity, so it was great. Um, and thanks again for coming on. Uh, if anyone, if you guys like this content, please make sure to like, subscribe, uh, leave us a comment or two, and we will we will see you next time. Thank you, guys.